Good morning and Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome to the first meeting of 2022 Session 6 of the Qualities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee. First agenda on our item is consideration of a negative instrument. I refer members to Paper 1. Do any members have any comments on civil partnership supplementary provisions relating to the recognition of overseas dissolutions, annulments or separations of Scotland Amendment Regulations 2021? I'm not hearing any. No members have indicated that they have any comments to make. Um, I, that being the case, are members content uh, formally not to make any comments to the Parliament on these instruments? If, uh, I can see everyone nodding. Thank you very much. So that is therefore agreed, and that concludes consideration of the SSI. The next um, agenda item is um, to. Begin um, taking evidence on the Minor Strike Pardon Scotland Bill, and um, I welcome Richard Leonard, uh, MSP, who is joining us for this item. Um, I welcome him to to the meeting. I also welcome to the meeting Nikki Wilson, President of the National Union of Mine Workers in Scotland, Robert Young, a board member from the Coalfields Regeneration Trust, Alex Bennett, former miner, and Professor Jim Phillips. Professor of Economic and uh, Social History in the University of Glasgow. For connectivity purposes, Robert Young and Alex Bennett will be contributing by audio only this morning, and I refer members to papers two and three. So, please, can I ask members to indicate which witness you are directing your questions to, um, and we can then open up the floor to other witnesses for, for comments. If other witnesses wish to respond to a question, please can I ask them to indicate that by typing R in the chat function on BlueJeans, and I will bring you in um, if time permits. Members can also use the chat function on BlueJeans to indicate if they want to add, ask a supplementary question. So I'll, I'll invite each of our witnesses now to make a short opening statements, as if, if they wish to, starting with Nikki Wilson, please. Yes, good morning and thanks for the invitation, convener. Um Nikki Wilson, I'm at present president of the National Union of Mine Workers. I started in industry in nineteen sixty seven at Cardown Colliery Depths and moved to Longanic Complex thereafter. I first became involved in the union in nineteen seventy two and have been secretary of the Scottish uh, branch of the NUM since 1989. Uh, I was a participant in the strike and remained on in the dis dispute to the end. So I have good knowledge of what happened then and in the intervening years after it and before. So that's my background. <clears throat> Thank, thank you very much, uh, Nikki. Can I now ask uh, Robert Young, please? Um, I'm Bob Young. I I was chairman of the National Union of Mine Workers at Comrie Colliery, uh, and I happened to have Arthur Scargill down my pit the day the strike started. I started in the pit in 1958, and I worked in four pits, the Francis, the Michael, the Wellesley, and ended up at the uh, Comrie Colliery. I was chairman of the strike centre here in Dunfermline. I, have, I was obviously involved with the strike all the way through, and at the end of the strike, uh, I was dismissed from the from the, the the coal board. Well, I was dismissed by the coal board uh, for my actions during the strike. So I had a lot of involvement in the strike, and uh, and can certainly fill you in with, with any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank thank, thank you, Robert. If we can now uh, move to Alex Bennett, please. Yep. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. My name's Alex Hi, Bennett. Alex. I'm standing in the coal industry. In 1962, I was a member of the committee at Milton Hall Colliery, and I was elected chairman of the National Union of Mine Workers in 1979. So I was very much involved in the strike, and I was a member of the Central Strike Committee and the Lothians. Uh, I was participated in the strike, and I was arrested at uh, Folsom Glen. 
the only time I've ever been arrested in my life, and I'm now 75 next week, and uh, two weeks after I was in court, I was fined £100, I received a P45 through my door with the manager of the pit telling me that I was summarily dismissed. And uh, the main man behind all the dismissals in Scotland was Albert Wheeler. And I've no doubt about that. And I hope that comes out in the end today. Thank you, Alec. Um, can I now um, ask um, Professor Jim Phillips if you'd like to say a few words? Thank you, convener. Hi, everyone. I'm Jim Phillips, um, Professor of Economic and Social History. I've been researching the coal industry and its history, the history of the the um, strike since around 2006. I've authored a, a couple of books uh, on the strike and on the miners in Scotland across the 20th century. I worked um, with John Scott in the uh, undertaking and the completion of the independent review of policing in the minor strike. I'm currently writing a book on the theme of justice and the strike in 1984-85. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to come here today. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, and th thanks to all of you for your opening remarks. We'll now move um, straight to questions, um, and I'll start with Fulton McGregor, please. Uh, is that me on? Uh, thanks, convener, and um, happy New Year to everybody, and, uh, including our um, panel members. Um, I just wanted to say, as a, a, an outset, uh, at the outset, that um, I'm the MSP for Coatbridge and Christon, which has a very rich mining uh, tradition. Already, I think one of our witnesses has mentioned Cardown, which is in Steps, which is in my constituency, but also the Auckland Geek um, Memorial. Uh, site is in uh, my constituency as well. And if I could put on record my thanks uh, to um, Willie Doolan and his team for the absolutely fantastic work that they do um, for the memorial every single year, which is a, an absolutely um, fantastic uh, commemorative event. And I would encourage all members. Uh, I know Richard Leonard's here, and, and he attends regularly. Uh, at it as well, but I'd, uh, I'd encourage all members, witnesses, and MD watching to come along to that to see a mining community very much um, in action. Um, I, so I just wanted to say that at the outset. I guess I've got quite a few questions. I'm really glad to see this bill uh, now making its way through Parliament. It's it's long overdue, uh, and it's about time. So I want to put my put that on the record right away. Um, I think that you know it will come as no surprise that I stand in complete solidarity with the mining communities that have been affected uh, by these strikes. But our, our, obviously, our business today is to scrutinise the bill and see how we can make the bill better. So I want to start by asking the panel, in any in any order that you wish to take, convener, um, about the uh, the the impact, the lasting impact of the strikes and the subsequent charges. Uh, and prosecutions, the impact that that had on uh, on the mining communities, such as in Middlesbrough, um, at Auckland Geek, um, or Cardown, or or anywhere anywhere in the country. Um, and as I say, I'm happy to take in any order. Okay, so so Fulton's done exactly what I'm not looking for by putting it back to me to, to bring enough. everybody in. But I guess given it's the first question, why why don't we start with Alec, the one I just. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Thank you. I can cover the question. I was based in the, the Lothian Coalfield, although I was worked at Milkton Hall. There was quite a lot of activity went around uh, Bilson Glen. Well, not just miners for, for Scotland were in attendance, but there was also miners from Durham. Now, it had a lasting effect in the community. The families were split in the middle. Uh, it was unbelievable, some of the things that went on. And one of the things, I don't know if it's been recorded, but Bilson Glen, most of the most of the miners that were sacked in Scotland, when I worked in Mugter Hall, there was 46 men sacked. They were arrested at Bilson Glen. And... There was lads at Bilson Glen who worked in the Durham coalfield, 
and not one former miner for the Durham Coalfield was sacked for being arrested at Bolson Glen, even though they attended the course in Edinburgh. So there, <laughs> there is a, a distinction between what was happening in Scotland and the rest of the British Coalfield on the dismissals. Certainly on the dismissals. And if you, well, it's, it's well documented all the all the films that was ever made about the miners' strike, whether it was Billy Elliot or Brastoff or Ride, everyone came out in favour of the National Union of Mine Workers. And that gives you a rough idea what the effect was like in the mining communities. And it's coming up for uh, 38 years. It's a long time, and there's still divisions. Yeah, I, I think. Uh, thank, thanks, Alec. I think um, that this question is quite wide, so I will, we'll, we'll hear from from everyone. Um, Robert, I mean, I, I agree with what Alex saying. Uh, because I live in Dunfermline, uh, it's not so much a, a, a small community, but our pit was out to Oakley, Comrie Pit, and you had Oakley, Blair Hall, Valleyfield, small villages. The knock-on effect of that was that uh, obviously the, the shops, the clubs, the pubs, everything's sort of closed down since since uh, since your industry went to the wall, and uh, that's been the the main contribution really of the the closure of the pits. But as Alex says, we, we've got a situation up. Well, we had a situation up here in Scotland where. I used to go out to the pit in the morning as the chairman and make sure that the firemen uh, were allowed in just to cover the pit. As soon as they changed the policing, and that was to take the five police away and put police from Edinburgh and Glasgow in their place, the whole situation changed dramatically. And uh, that's when the conflict started. And trust me, it wasn't us that started the conflict. And I was one of the guys who was at Orgreave. And when you look at the film of Orgreave, you would think it was us that started the trouble. If somebody would only show the true film or grief when the police charged us with their horses before anything had happened, then they would see the reality of the situation. We were we were well set up by the media and by and by whoever took the decisions and and you can have your own guess at who took the decisions about the mining strike. Thank you. Thank, thank, thanks, Robert. Nicky? If I could convene, I'll just to widen it slightly because I think there is this belief that you know Arthur Scargo snapped his fingers and the miners all went in strike. But the actual facts were in the two years leading up to the strike in Scotland, we'd already had six pits closed. Wales had seven, the North East England had five. And some of those areas had been agitating on the national executive to get an action which subsequently led to the, the overtime ban in October uh, 1983. But that is why the difference between the strikes I was involved in before in 72 and 74 was that was about terms and conditions wages. People knew within our industry that we were fighting for our very survival. We'd seen what happens to communities when a pit closes. And because of the close knit community round about some of the collieries, the ongoing adverse effects that had. And I've been a member. I was a former a former member or, or trustee of the Coalfield Regeneration Trust since 1999 till this day. And some of our communities have still not recovered properly from the effects of that. And I think people. I know people. On the committee are probably too young to remember it in a way, but it's important the background is there because that is why I think the strength and solidarity was so strong during the strike because we knew we either stood and tried to fight to save our industry, save our communities, or we lay on our back and gave up and we tried it, didn't work. And I think in the subsequent years, the number of pit closures, well, by the end of the, the 80s, we had down to one complex in Scotland, and there was 11 pits in 85 at the end of the strike and three workshops. So that is how rapid the deterioration of our industry came, which a lot of us knew would happen if we didn't win that strike, and unfortunately we didn't. But that's my view of the ongoing effects of the strike. Thank you. And Jim? 
<clears throat> Thank you, convener. What Nikki's just been talking about really is the unjust transition that took place. Uh, it was hidden. It was hidden from the communities by the, the government. The government at the time had um, plans which they denied the existence of uh, for the closure of pits and the redundancy of about two thirds of the Scottish mine workers between 1984 and 1990, which came to fruition. It is entirely fitting. But the Scottish Parliament, I, I must emphasise, is, is to the fore here in delivering potentially justice um, to minors, because the strikers in Scotland, and Alec was alluding to this before, were um, twice as likely to be arrested as strikers in England and Wales, and they were three times more likely to be dismissed as a result of their strike activities as strikers in England and Wales. Now, many of these arrests took place within communities, and that, that's one area of the bill that I do have a slight reservation about. But the bill um, makes provision for the pardon from strikers um, who had convictions that arose from events on picket lines, on strike-related demonstrations, and other related gatherings. But they don't make doesn't make provision for minors who were convicted after incidents in communities. And I think that is an important deficiency. We might have time to explore that a little bit further. But the first thing I would like to add at this stage is that many of these incidents were created by the, the tensions and the conflicts that were introduced to mining communities by the actions of the National Coal Board. And it is absolutely unprecedented decision during an official industrial dispute to organise a strike-breaking effort, and they exposed these communities to conflict. They left the strike breakers within the communities alongside the strikers. I think what is remarkable, looking at events in the long run, is how little tension there actually was within those communities. It is remarkable how restrained miners and their families were individually, collectively, when faced with, uh, with that level of of stress. Thank, thanks, Jim. And Pam Duncan Glancy wants to come in for a brief um, thing. I, I guess it's to Jim. Is that correct? It, it is. Thank, thank you, um, convener, and, and thank you so much uh, to, to all the panel who have spoken already. Um, and before I, I go into the kind of questions later that, that I uh, sought to bring today, I just want to also send my solidarity to the miners who were on strike. Um, in the early 80s. I was really young at the time, um, but I heard a lot about it in my family. Um, the, the name Arthur Scargill was something that was quite common in our household. Um, and so I, I do send my solidarity to those communities, and particularly um, in Blantyre, for example, across the, um, in, in the Glasgow region that I represent. My specific question was um, in a follow-up to the point that you just made, Jim, around what was going on in communities. And they, I think you said that the, the board had caused tensions by exposing strikers to conflict. And I was interested to hear your point about those people um, in communities not necessarily being covered by the bill. Can you talk a little bit about the sorts of things that were going on in communities and, and what was happening to those people who are not going to be part of this bill unless it is a change, which it hopefully would be? We would have to say fairly minor arguments between individuals within communities, in streets, outside houses, outside shops. But those arguments were, were were not normal. It wasn't a normal social situation, and that that's one thing that I'm very keen that the committee comes to appreciate that this was a highly abnormal social situation. Nikki and and Bob and Alec have outlined the um, the immense economic difficulties confronting those communities, and um, those communities were defending their economic future. Um, the, uh, the the defence of that future involved um, uh, the, the you know, arguments between neighbours um, over the strike. Um, I, I mean, I, I feel a certain amount of empathy for, um, for for people who were arguing with their neighbours uh, about the the um, their actions in breaking the strike. I mean, it, 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 that that um, put immense pressure onto the 
onto the kind of harmony within communities. It wasn't normal for people <laughs> to gather outside their neighbours' houses. Um, it wasn't normal to break windows. It wasn't normal to attack people's cars. It wasn't normal to have fights in the street outside chip shops. And these are the things that happened during a highly abnormal social situation. And it seems to me um, that one of the slight dangers here within the bill is, is that we're creating a hierarchy of, of justice, that there's the deserving of justice, um, who include um, you know, minors who are arrested on picket lines, and the undeserving of justice, young lads at the time who got into fights with strike breakers in, in the street um, on, on the way home um, from a picket line or from um, while, while they were going around um, uh, their business. So I, I think it's, it's understandable that we've arrived at this situation, uh, but I'd, I'd like us all to be aware of how abnormal that, and how conflictual that social situation was and how that conflict was imposed from outside of mining communities by policymakers at UK level and by uh, employers, specifically the, the coal board that was providing organised transport that was um, coordinating this activity with the police, it was behaving in, in highly provocative uh, ways um, at the time. Thank you. And back to Fulton McGregor, please. Uh, thanks, Convener. <clears throat> Just to thank the panel for their um, evidence so far. I, I mean, I think Jim Phillips raises a really good point there that will probably um, be the, the, the bulk of our discussions um, when taking evidence on this bill, and that's around around the scope of the bill. And actually, Jim, you've you've raised something there that in, until you provided that evidence, I, I hadn't actually thought of myself about the offences that were committed in the communities um, surrounding the minor strike. But I did want to ask as well about um, obviously this, this this is a pardon for minors, and um, the, the the bill clearly defines minors um, and, and and what a minor was. But I don't, you, you know. Should the scope be um, increased to for those who perhaps supported minors on on the strikes? You mean family, friends, um, and were also charged or, or convicted? And I suppose that that would be a question for you, Jim. But for the other panel um, panelists, um, those who were there, was that something that happened? Were friends uh, and family members convicted as well as minors, or, or is it, or is that not really something? Because a bit like Pam, I, I was. Um, only a pup as well when uh, the strikes actually took place. I was about about six years of age, but but you know, like everybody that, that was in these communities, it, it shaped our, our upbringings. We heard about it through school. I can even remember it being talked about in primary school. You know, that's that, that's how big an impact it had. But I would be interested to hear from those that were there. Was it just minors that were ultimately charged, or were there others? And therefore, should the um, the, the scope of the bill be increased in in, in that respect as well? Uh, Jim, if I could come to you first, and then, then maybe to some of the other panellists who want to come in. I mean, I'd, I'd suggest hearing from the others first, um, because I'm, I'm very young as well. Okay, we, we, we're not going to be able to have everyone in the panel. And committee members need to be a bit more selective, please. Um, Nikki, do you want to? Yeah, I, I was just going to follow on for Jim and say that, I mean, what, what people. It's hard to picture it, but the National Coal Board, some of the people that went back to work, in my experience, in my area, I was in joint charge of the Cardown Strike Centre during the strike, and we covered quite a vast area that's been related to the Fulton. And one of the things the Coal Board done, for instance, there was a, a guy in Cumbernauld who went back to his work. Uh, he previously worked at Cardown, and he was working at Francis, and they got him a car. Uh, the coal board actually supplied the car, allegedly bought him the car to get to his work. <clears throat> and the other things that happened, and thankfully there were few and far between in our area, but one day a person could be on strike, and the next day the coal board could persuade them, because throughout the strike there was various bribes offered about a bonus at Christmas time, all your holiday pay, all the rest of it. This was an ongoing process that the National Coal Board were carrying out. So when there were spontaneous demonstrations, and that's what they were, it was because people found out that the guy that was in strike was no longer in strike, and therefore a group within that, be it wives, daughters, whatever family members, 
had a spontaneous reaction to that and, went and had a demonstration at the House. And I know some of them did get arrested. The problem is the union organised, because we organised demonstrations, picket lines, we had, a, we had an inkling and a, a record kept to everybody who was arrested, but not in the community side. And I would support what Jim previously raised. It is important to remember that not everything was organised through the official means during the strike. And these spontaneous demonstrations, if you like, within the communities or disputes, I believe should be covered as well in the pardon. Okay, thanks. Philip, you want to hear from somebody else as well? Um, if somebody else wants to come in, uh, convener, I realise that there is there was four witnesses today, but uh, if somebody else wants to come in on that. Anyone particularly keen just now, or is Nikki covered? Okay, can I move to um, Maggie, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. And uh, good morning to everybody. Happy New Year. And thank you to the panellists. For, for, for being with us this morning. I'm sorry we can't be meeting in person. Can I, like uh, Pam and Fulton um, have already done, express my solidarity with um, the miners, their families and communities that were affected and continue to, to be affected um, by what happened in the 80s? I wasn't in the country at the time. I, I was uh, growing up in Zimbabwe, but it did, it did permeate our, 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 our media in, in Southern Africa. Um, like Fulton, I, I think this bill is long overdue, and I, I look forward to, to, to helping support its progress uh, through, through Parliament over, over the next wee while. We, we've had um, quite a lot of discussion about the scope of, but uh, both in terms of definition of minor, in terms of uh, the, the constraints um, placed on, on what, what offences are, are included. And th thank, thank you, Jim, for, for outlining some of your, your uh, critiques of, of, those, of those constraints quite clearly. I think um, we, we will return to those. So I, I was going to explore those a little bit further, but I think, I think those have been covered. If I can turn to um, justice issues um, a, a little bit more. Um, Bob and Alec, you both mentioned that you had been um, dismissed uh, as strikers, and, and Alex, you said in, in your opening remarks that you had been arrested. Can you can you just describe for us what 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 that was like? How how both both from from the police point of view, but but the the, the justice system as well. How all of that uh, how how that was for you. What what your experience of, of that was. A question for, first for Alec, and then I'll come back in. Okay. Okay, I mean it was okay. It was a it was a terrible atmosphere. Uh, during a minor strike, it was it started in March, and nothing really happened until June, with police arrests. Now, as Bob mm -hmm. Young already says, it wasn't in the local police who were initially on the picket lines. It was police from outside. And there had been a, a change of attitude in June '84 when they were making mass arrests, and it was done with snatch squads. They were just picking out individuals. I was picked too, probably because I was chairman of Monkton Hoy NGM. I was arrested along with David Hamilton, who was the delegate, and, and John Glenn, who was the secretary of Monkton Hall. We were all arrested at the same time, and really, it was it was terrible. But it wasn't until later on that we realised that Wheeler's instruction was that anybody that had been arrested wasn't just going to get fined. They were going to lose their job, lose their the redundancy payment. I was an official of the Miners' Union, and we used to sit in when men were getting made redundant. And I knew exactly what I would have got if I got made redundant at that time. I would have qualified for £27,000. In 1985, I never got that, and uh, it's still bitter to this day that I was denied that because of the attitude to the Coburn in Scotland. Thank you, thank you very much for, for that, Alec. Bob, do you want to do you want to say something about the the justice and and, and the way the way that was all of that was handled? Yeah, th thanks, Maggie. Thanks. Um, 
I, I have to bother and say, I, I mean, I was arrested more than once. I was, I was arrested uh, quite a few times, and uh, uh, and the, the funny thing was, I was only charged the once, uh, and that was at Cart Moor. There was a hundred and thirty. There are 135 arrested. I might be wrong with it, with that number, Maggie, but it was 130 odds were arrested and two years got sacked. And we were both contributors to the, the National Union of Mine Workers. And uh, so I think that tells a story in, in, in itself. And if it hadn't been for, uh, for, for a friend of mine, uh, Mar Margot MacDonald, who was actually working for STV at the time, and she made a television, well, she made three television programs about me. I might have been like that, like I never got my job back, I never got my redundancy. As I maintain, I was sacked twice. I was sacked uh, initially for, for my actions, and then I was sacked when they closed Comrie Pit, and I never got offered a transfer. But could I just say this, convener? People have to remember the psychological side of the minor strike. If you get into sort of November, December time, after being been strike eight or nine months, and you wonder why there was trouble out in the streets. People had lost their holidays. There was no money coming in for Christmas. And uh, you, have to, you have to understand that the psychological effect that was having on people. And I mean, I know for a fact there were two guys for a side dockyard who were working on a side dockyard were arrested uh, with us along at Cartmore. Now, what happened to them, I'm assuming they got fined along with us, but uh, um, they're, they're never going to get the... the <laughs> They're, they're in not the same position as us, and that's wrong. Like, right? you no, know, they should be in the same position as us. And for the life of me, I can't remember their name, convener. But uh, think about the psychological effects of this, and then, and then the actions that took place outside in the community. Thank you very much, Bob. And just a final wee question, if, if I may, Joe, and, and this is to Jim. Jim, from your research and, and from the, the, the um, people that you've spoken to and, and, and the work that you've done on this, what is your view of how the justice system functioned? Um, what was, was it, in your view, um, fair? What, what was it, was it uh, de dealing with the situation appropriately, or were there significant issues um, with, with, the, with the justice system through all of this? I think there are very strong circumstantial, um, there's very strong circumstantial evidence of collusion between the police and the coal board officials. Um, the criminal justice system clearly uh, worked um, as a strike breaking and disciplining measure. It supported the co the coal board's victimization of trade unionism and trade unionists. Um, the um, ways in which miners were compelled to plead guilty in order to return to the picket lines is something that we haven't spoken about. Yet there may have been about 800 convictions in Scotland for strike-related offences. Many of those were, in effect, uh, false confessions, or they were um, pragmatic exercises by minors in order to avoid periods of detention and remand, in order to return to their communities and to support the strike. Um, Sheriffs imposed very strenuous bail conditions on minors who appeared before them, and those bail conditions included um, a requirement not to attend picket lines and strike-related demonstrations. So there was a th thoroughly anti-trade union uh, atmosphere within which criminal justice was uh, exerted against, against the strikers. It's a sorry episode. Thank you for laying that out so clearly, Jim. I'll, I'll leave it there, Joe. Thanks. Thank you. And Alexander Stewart, please. Thank you, convener, and good morning, uh, gentlemen. Thank you very much for your opening statements. <coughs> I'm Alexander Stewart. I'm a Conservative member for Mid Scotland and Fife, uh, and uh, I've stood in elections in 2016 and 2021 in the constituency of Dunblane and Clackmannanshire. Uh, so the area that I have represented and, and supported over the last few years uh, has still the scars of the minor strike uh, and 
uh, that runs deep, uh, and I have been well aware of that uh, over the, the tenure of my uh, membership here as a member of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, today, I'd like to sort of tease out some aspects about the strike itself. Now, I do remember the strike. I remember the visual, the reports, uh, the media coverage, and for me, it certainly was one of them, or it appeared the perception was, and it would be good to get your view on this as well, the perception was that it was one of the most bitter and divisive industrial disputes within my lifetime that I can remember. Uh, it went on for a considerable length of time, uh, and uh, newspapers and, and media published and produced uh, photographs and uh, films that showed real aggression and tension across uh, the, the situation. So, when we look at that, we think about the policing of that, uh, and the police element was very strong. Uh, there was no doubt that there was a tension and even aggression uh, that, that seemed to come through from the, the perceptions that I had from viewing and just seeing uh, the, the, the structures that came on, on the screens. Uh, so it would be good to understand where and how that tension has erupted. Now, there were about, I think, 1,350 arrests, uh, and that went to about 470 court cases, and, as Professor Phillips has indicated, about 800. So there was about 85 per cent of the, the cases themselves uh, may, led to conviction. Uh, so can I just ask you, uh, and it would be for, for Nick initially, that tension and that aggression and that whole concept of creating, uh, was that really what was it like on the ground? You've talked about things at the beginning of the, the strike were quite low-key until things changed, but when it did change, is that the real perception of what it was like on the ground within some of these mining communities? Myself, convener, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I was you. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hey. I think, to be quite honest, it depends where you were, because somebody alluded to it, Cartmore, Hunterston, Ravenscraig, Bilson Glen. These were places where mass arrests took place. But I could tell you about picket lines that were there during the strike, where there was actually, if you like, in a word, friendliness between the pickets and the police. There was an understanding. There was no arrests. And the, the policy, I mean, it was related to that June was a mass arrest. It was actually May, and we we had the first use of mass arrest at Hunterston and Ravenscraig before Orgreave even took place in Scotland. I myself was arrested at Ravenscraig and was actually in charge of the picket line that day. And what subsequently happened? Just talk about the the, the feelings, the judiciary. I was a test case for all the miners arrested at Ravenscraig for legal aid. I don't know why it was me. I had a wife and two kids at the time, and whether it was that, but I had to attend the sheriff's chambers. And Manus, the late Manus McGuire, Thompson Slitters, he represented me, and he won the case that the miners arrested at Ravenscraig should receive laid because with no income and all the rest of it are very little. And when the sheriff conceded that I that he would give the legal aid, Manus McGuire, I remember him asking, does that mean that's everybody as this is a test case? And the sheriff said, No, everybody will be treated individually. And that that is where it happens. We also have a lot of proof and we were getting leaked faxes at that time. That's how long ago it was. But the Procurator Fiscal's Office in Scotland faxed the National Coal Board every day with every miner that was arrested. So that was collusion again between judiciary, if you like, in a way, and the Coal Board. But your point about where was it in general? No, I can't say it was in general. If you were at Bilson Glen, yes. If you were at Ravenscray, yes. If you were at Hunterston, yes. If you are at Cartmore, but in most other places and picket lines, there was a kind of understanding, and it wasn't as bad. So, really, I suppose the answer to your original question was it depended where you were. 
if you if you think about Ravens Craig, why was there about twenty five police vans lined up every time the lorries came through? They weren't there because they were thinking there may be arrest. There was arrest through the snatch squads, which is how I got arrested. And incidentally, I was the last person arrested, and they always left one van and took the other ones away to Hamilton or Motherwell Police Station. So I sat for over an hour with one policeman in the back of the van at Ravenscraig until they emptied the other ones and brought them all back before the next convoy came in. And I, I got to know, well, I'm saying I got to know him. I was chatting away with the policeman, and he actually told me, he says, we don't want to be involved in this. So I said to him, well, open the door and let me out, but he wouldn't concede to that. So I didn't get away in that sense. But the attitude of the police I found in a lot of the cases in picket lines, what, I don't think they were very happy about what they were doing. And there wasn't always the arrests and all that. As I say, it depended where you went, and in certain areas, the mass arrests were certainly pinpointed to take place. That's what happened. Thank you. And if I can maybe ask uh, Professor Phillips, what do you think of? I mean, there have been some views and opinions expressed, and you've done quite a lot of research into the way that people were treated uh, when they were arrested and the convictions that they then received. Uh, some people say that the, the pardoning of this uh, is giving the impression that there's a bit of rewriting of history taking place when they went through the judicial process. Uh, there was a, a situation, a circumstance, and they did receive uh, that criminal uh, offence and conduct. Uh, do you think that that was something that the judiciary was heavy-handed about? Uh, it's quite obvious from the miners themselves and what they've said this morning. They believe there was uh, collusion between uh, the judiciary, the coal board, and uh, maybe others, and the police uh, as to how this was managed. So it would be good to get your view, Professor Phillips, on, on some of that, because you're, you're the academic here who's looked at some of that, and it would be good to get your stance on some of it. Well, thank, thank you. Um, well, some of those others who were involved were members of the UK government at the time, and um, I read the minutes of the Cabinet Ministerial Group on Coal that was chaired by the Prime Minister, and these unambiguously indicate that that big mass roundup of arrests at Ravenscraig that Nicky Wilson was just talking about took place after the Prime Minister had asked the Secretary of State for Scotland to inquire as to why miners were being allowed to take the open road to attempt to blockade Ravenscraig and Hunterston. So there was political interference um, with the policing in Scotland. I think that's an important um, part of this um, of this story. Uh, uh, so far as your you know the, the broader issue is concerned, I, I think that the, the courts dealt with minors that were, were put in front of them by the police that were um, unambiguously concentrated on trade union activists, on trade union officials at pit level, people like Bob, Ali, Nikki, um, and a disproportionate high number of those uh, arrested and later convicted and sacked were trade union representatives. They were community um, representatives as well. And I think that was part of the effort that was undertaken by the coal board, in collusion with the police, in pursuit of the UK government's policy at the time of moving Scotland out of coal mining, it was a hidden agenda. I don't wish to come across as being in any way conspiratorial, because there are documents um, which point to the plans that the government had to reduce um, coal mining in Scotland, and the effort was focused. The disciplinary effort, the criminalisation, the victimisation was focused on trade union and community leadership in order to make the transition out of coal mining a lot more rapid, because it was removing blockages. It was removing opposition to that approach. Thank you, convener. Okay, thank you. Can I hear from uh, Karen, please? Thank you, Convener, and I want to thank the panel for their 
they're, they're candid testimonies um, this morning. And, and just to say, you know, I was quite young at the time as well. I was a nine-year-old girl from the northeast. But if you ask me, some of the most defining moments, um, news-worthy uh, moments uh, of my childhood, and you know, reflecting on the memories of that time, it would certainly be the minor strike. Um, you know, up in the, the top three of that, uh, uh, certainly. Um, so, to, so to hear that lived experience today um, has been, you know, really important, and um, I really thank you for that. And, and, and Jim as well, of course, for keeping note of that and keeping record in the work that you do. It's extremely important that this is docu documented um, um, for history. My question, Convener, is really around the pardon itself. And does the panel feel that there is any alternative to a pardon? Is this, do you feel, the right uh, and proper means um, to go about what, what we're trying to do here? Um, I'm wondering, could I go to Nikki for that first? Okay. Uh, yes, thank you. I think I'd go back to the point that Jim Phillips made initially, because it was something I had a number of discussions with the Scottish Government officials who were drawing up the bill, and I thought the community side of things had been, you know, covered in a sense, but. Unfortunately, I don't think the wording completely covers it. So I think the important thing is we need to widen it to include those that were involved in, in some disputes and maybe arrests in the communities that they are covered by the pardon. The point Bob made earlier, I think, about others, other workers, because there were other workers joined us in the picket lines at various times, and it may well be that they were arrested. So again, does it need tweak, tweaking a bit to cover that? But in general, I think that the other the other point that came, and I I, I managed to attend the eight uh, meetings that John Scott and his inquiry team I assisted them in setting them up in the eight different areas in Scotland. And the, there was a question about compensation, and, and I realise that wasn't covered by the the. You know the John Scott inquiry, but it did raise its head at a number of the meetings. And I mean, my view is, and I'm not, I've not got a clue about law or anything, that there was 206 men sacked in Scotland, and far more pro rata than anywhere else in the United Kingdom, certainly Wales, and more even in England. We were far, far more likely to be sacked because of the hard attitude of the area director, Albert Wheeler. And I think that is something that, if I don't know how it would be done, but whether the bill could relate to some way of looking at possible compensation, especially for the men that were sacked. I mean, people like Alec, he's not said it, but Alec was blacklisted from getting a job by a number of firms for a number of years. He eventually get back into mining in a, with a contractor that worked in mining years later. But these guys' careers, for a one-off instance, say an arrest for breach of the peace, lost all their, 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 you know, their employability, they lost their pension rights. And even the guys, even guys that were one tribunal for over the next small period of time after the strike, they were never reinstated. They were re-employed, which meant all their previous service, everything about their pension didn't count anymore. So there's a big, big injustice lurking in the background in the compensation aspect. And I don't know if that's something that could be looked at to somehow get in there and see if there's any feasibility or possibility. Are these 260 men or their families now for the ones that are deceased to be some way compensated? But in general, I've got to say that the, 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 the NUM in Scotland and nationally, which I represent as well, really do welcome the fact that the Scottish Government have brought this forward. And we did think it was a brave step in a sense, because we have been arguing for years for this. But up until 2015, as, as Jim referred to, 30 years after when the Cabinet papers started coming out, then it was proved, which people, a lot of people always suspected, that the finger of government was actually conducting this strike in the background. And that is why it took so long, really, to bring a lot of this to the fore. 
But that's my view. Certainly, the community side needs to be widened out, and I would say that the, the compensation, if possible, if it can be fitted in there somewhere, it would be a brilliant move by the you know, Scottish Parliament in that sense. Thanks, Kentina. Thank you, Nikki. Hey, Carmen. Yeah, I'm happy with that, convener. Yeah, thanks. Um, Pam, Pam Duncan, glance in now, please. Testimony and your, your candid testimony. Um, yeah, I want to touch a little bit on compensation and also the psychological impact that the, the strikes had in communities and in, and in participating in it and their families. Um, so maybe um, Bob and Alex, if you could, um, and Nikki, if there's time as well, if we could hear a little bit about the feeling among the communities at the time about the way they were being treated and the impact that's had in the long term, both emotionally, psychologically, um, and also financially. And then um, I had hoped to, to hear your views on compensation. So, um, and, and I, I heard uh, yours, Nikki, and I, I think that some form of compensation looks. Um, looks, looks to be appropriate, but it would be good to hear um, what, what Bob and Alex think of that as well, please. Thanks. So, Bob, perhaps first? Yeah, well, thanks, thanks, convener, and thanks, Pam, thanks for that. Can I, I just say, regarding, I'm the only miner in Britain that's been fully reinstated, convener, into the mining industry, and it was because of Margot MacDonald and the programme she made about me and the fact that the coal board went to my, tribu to my tribunal and lied, but fortunately I had tape recorded all my interviews with the coal board without telling them, and was able to use that uh, as a means of, of proving my, my innocence, if you would like. With, with, regard, to, Pam, with, with regard to our community, if, if I was to give you three good instances, uh, where I lived, there were, unfortunately there were two guys went back to work. Um, I was going to cry in my nerve, but I won't. Uh, uh, no far from me. Now, my cats got poisoned. When I phoned the police, there was nothing the police could do. My car windows got broken. When I phoned the police, the police said uh, they didn't have anybody that they could send down. When my, when my front window got broken, the police couldn't send anybody down. because they, And yet, at the same time, they had guys, they had policemen sitting outside these two guys' houses on a 24-hour basis protecting their homes. That was the way we were being treated as individuals. I mean, that was the difference between me as a striking miner and uh, and these guys that, that went back to work. And these guys that went back to work, Nicky was, was, uh, was alluding to the fact that there was offers being made. There was 10 guys returned to Comrie Pit late on in the strike. Every one of them was offered a financial contribution um, to go back to, the, to their work. And when the strike finished, the ten of them immediately got redundancy. Now, that was the way the coal board were dealing with people and dealing with us. Thanks, convener. Thank you. And was it was it Alec you were looking for next, Pam? Thank you, Alec. Yes, On the compensation, I mean, it did have an effect in communities where I live. I live in a village called Nandarot. It's just it was built for a house miners for Moncton Hall. And you had, uh, after the strike, where families were getting quite substantial redundancy payments, and the families of miners who were sacked were getting nothing. And I, I know in certain, no with me, but in certain circumstances, uh, uh, marriages broke up, uh, and kids were left without mothers. And it was, uh, honestly, really careful to see some of the things that went on and some of it still exists in there. But I just want to make a point that Alex Stewart, the MSP, had made with the police in. Uh, and it was some of the things that were reported and some of the things that weren't reported. Now, as I said, I covered Moncton Hall as the chairman of the NEM at Moncton Hall. And we were at Moncton Hall, and it was only last year when... Uh, the soldier died in jail after stealing all the money when he shot the soldiers up the pentlands and stole the money. Now, the inspector informed me and another two officials at the NGM that they had a problem up in the Pentland Hills where soldiers had been shot 
as being a robbery. And we agreed to stand in the picket and allow the police to go into their duty to pursue whoever done the shooting. And that was us working with the police. That was working with the local police. And that's what was achieved when everything was localised. But when it was changed, we didn't care if any of the inspectors were or what they were. Though there was a lot of goodwill, and Nicky mentioned it previously or not, a lot of the police didn't want to be in the picket line. I mean, they lived in the mining communities. Their brothers were miners. And a lot of that didn't come out. It just seems to be a one-sided affair that came out during the strike, where there was a lot of good stuff, where the NEM, especially the NEM, was working with the police to help where injustices were taking place in the communities. Thank you. Palm, are you good? That, thank you. Can I ask a short supplementary, uh, Joe, if that's okay? Yeah. Uh, th- thank you both um, for, for that testimony. Um, it's, it's, it's shocking, some of, some of the experiences that you're describing. Um, and I kind of thought I had a, a real understanding of how bad it was, but um, yeah, that's, that's really, really um, incredible. The, what do you think accounts for the difference in the number of arrests and the number of disciplinaries and dismissals in Scotland as opposed to elsewhere in, in the UK. And if it's OK, I'll maybe ask Jim and Bob if you could um, have a go at that one. After you, Bob. Yeah, well, th- th- thanks, Jim. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I have to put it down to all, but we were dealing with whoever was in charge of the policing in, in Scotland, and uh, and we don't know who that was, but whatever direction Albert Wheeler gave con- contributed to the arrest in, in Scotland, and, and that there's, there can be no doubt about that whatsoever, because as Nicky says, you, you just had, we, we went picketing down to, to other places, and we never had the problems we had up here with regard to the arrest. So, Whoever was dealing with Albert Wheeler and, and whoever gave the instruction to Albert Wheeler, and was it McGregor who told Wheeler and was McGregor given an instruction by a political leader then? I don't know. But I, I mean, I couldn't approve that. But at the end of the day, I'd, I'd leave it up to other people to, to make their own mind up about it. Thanks, Kendina. Yeah, and, and Jim? Very briefly, I think it's uh, unambiguously clear that, that um, the individual concerned, Albert Wheeler, figurehead for the National Coal Board in Scotland, with his officials, saw a, a future for a very much smaller industry in Scotland that would be concentrated on the pits supplying the Long Gannet power station, and possibly including still the two big Lothian pits that we've heard about, Bilston Glen. And Monkton Hall, but that required um, much stronger managerial control over those workplaces. It required um, coal to be extracted um, at a much greater uh, rate, much greater worker effort was required. Corners were likely going to be cut in terms of health and safety. So, for a variety of reasons, the effort plan was was designed on reducing the role of trade unions within a much reduced um, industry. So, closing it down altogether in Ayrshire, after Lanarkshire, reducing it still further in Fife, and just concentrating on West Fife and bits of bits of the Lothians, and that required the attack uh, on trade union and community leadership. Thanks, Jim. Can I go to Pam Gossel, please? Thank you, convener, and Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you to all the witnesses today coming along and um, giving evidence today. Like most of the members have described today, I was also very young when the uh, minor strikes were happening. However, I do remember the horrific scenes on television. At the time, I was very young. I did not understand, obviously, what was happening. However, so today, I absolutely welcome that we have such had such a great insight and lived experiences 
from the people it happened to. So thank you so much for coming on today. My question is around asking about the lasting impact on miners and mining communities. Given that the impact of strikes continue today, uh, more than three decades later, I'd like to ask you your views on what the lasting impacts of the strike and its policing on miners and mining communities are. And my question would be first, obviously, looking for a bit of, uh, on the side of research, uh, I'd like to ask Professor Philip, and then if I could ask um, Nikki Wilson as well, please. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, well, in brief, um, I think the um, there's a tendency to uh, exaggerate the damage that was caused um, socially, culturally, to those communities. Yes, uh, as as Bob and, and Alec have been telling us, rightly, employment, economic activity was was radically reduced within those communities. But when we speak to people, our friends, neighbours within those communities, we find communities that are still very cohesive, um, very progressive very positive about the present as well as the future. They're not looking back all the time. They're not obsessed with the past, um, but they are determined that they receive justice for the wrongs that were committed against their communities in the past. So they're, they're good places. Good people live there. Um, I'm proud to have friends within those communities. And, uh, Nikki? Yes, uh, thanks. I mean, the long-lasting effect that I'd mentioned earlier, I've, since 1999, I've been a trustee on the Coalfield Regeneration Trust. And because of the work that's done in the communities, Jim's right, communities, and it's not just mining communities, but I think it's more inherent in mining communities. There is a, an inborn strength there that because miners looked after each other, they went to work together, families were in need, they looked after each other. And that that still exists to this day, I believe. The economic effects are obvious because of the job losses, especially in some of the remoter communities, you know, like in parts of Ayrshire, some of the West Five villages in, in Stirlingshire, the villages that, where there was virtually a pit and a village and a community built round about it. And when that was lost, it's never been replaced by other forms of employment or otherwise. So that the legacy of that still exists today. But I, I don't think I mean there was a mistrust of the police, I would say, for a long time after it. But I think most of it and people should remember this that I would say the vast majority of miners that were arrested during the strike had never had a previous conviction before or after that. And therefore, they were law abiding citizens. And I think today, there is, I'm not saying the disrespect to police, you might get the odd ones. Everybody knows the police must exist to look after our communities, keep them safe and all the rest of it. But Jim's right in the sense that that legacy of the way the police were used, not the rank and file police, but somebody way up higher made decisions on the mass arrest, and that stigma of a guy maybe losing his job in the 206 cases, or even being arrested and being classified as a criminal, stuck for a long time and still exists. And that's why I think it's so important that this committee and hopefully the Scottish Parliament passes this bill to some of the suggestions made, because it will right or wrong. For it's been there for many, many years, and I think. Generally, we are law-abiding people in mining communities, same as other communities, and that will continue. But to right this wrong will be a brilliant move, and I hope it is successful. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. Pam? Thank you much for your responses there. Um, Nikki, um, just talking about when you said the, you know, writing that right to a wrong, obviously lessons were learned as well. Moving on, and so many decades later, there are still strikes that happen today, a lot more controlled and maybe a lot more behaved better. Is there anything that you could maybe compare against that time to now that you think that hasn't happened in the strikes that um, should actually still happen better than what happened then? 
Well, I, I think, to be honest, and this is me speaking with my trade union hat on, obviously, but we've got to remember the legislation that's been changed over the years. I mean, during the miners' strike, all the funds of the National Union of Mine Workers were sequestrated in England and Wales because they deemed, the strike was deemed not to be legal. That did not happen in Scotland because the person that took the case in Scotland and under Scottish law, the strike was not illegal. So a lot of the money that was passed out to other areas came through Scotland at that time. So I think the difference is that over the years, the legislation that has been introduced to limit and change how trade unions act in industrial disputes even the way they've got to get a percentage of the vote, and so many members of the union have to take part in the vote, has meant that I doubt if we'll ever see anything like this again. You know, and it's not as a trade unionist we didn't, <laughs> nobody wanted that strike. But as I tried to say earlier, we were fighting. We knew what was coming down the line, that is, and the fact the pit closures all the rest of it, how that affected their communities, no other alternative jobs, all the rest of it. And really, our backs were against the wall, and we stood and fought. Unfortunately, we lost. And what we tried to prevent did happen, there is no doubt about it. But to try and relate to what happened then and today, I do not know. I do not think it would happen again. I think it is very much difficult for trade unions to organise workforces than it was then. You think we had a nationalised industry, like other nationalised industry, nearly 100, probably 100 per cent trade union members. So much more difficult now for trade unions to organise in the present type of workforces we've got. So as I don't think you can make a comparison to what happened then and what could happen today, to be quite honest. Thank you. Thank you. And can I um, go to Richard Leonard, please. Uh, Complina, thank you very much, and, and uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity of, um, of asking a question this morning. Uh, because I think, um, as Karen Adams said, uh, this is uh, the strike was a defining moment in modern Scottish history, and I think uh, this will be a defining moment for the Scottish Parliament to make sure that we get this legislation right. Um, I was old enough uh, to be around during the miners' strike and uh, was living in Stirling at the time. And uh, the Paul Mays colliery was, of course, one of the flashpoints which precipitated the uh, the national strike. Um, a, a couple of points I wanted to make, convener, if I may. Uh, first of all, um, Bob introduced himself as the NUM chairman at Comrie. Alex Bennett introduced himself as the NUM chairman at Monkton Hall. Nicky Wilson. Uh, now, uh, the president of the union uh, was also very active, and so I think we need to understand that this was a, a clear attempt to decapitate the leadership um, of the union, and uh, that's got to be, uh, I think, recognised in our approach to uh, what happened and what we uh, now need to do. Um, Alec has spoken about his own experience, and I was uh, in preparing for today reading the testimony of. Kathy Mitchell from Kakodi, um, because uh, it was families as well as the miners themselves who were affected uh, by what happened. Uh, and she told of her husband, John, who was blacklisted, who was convicted of obstruction in 1984 and fined five pounds. And it resulted in him losing out on a 26,000 pound redundancy from the Francis Colliery. So these were very real uh, challenges. And that's why I think it's perfectly legitimate for us to look at compensation, because there was a clear financial hardship and detriment uh, that was caused. And I hope that during the course of the deliberations in the Parliament, that's something that we will uh, address. One of the arguments that's been uh, put against that, and this is what I wanted to put uh, in my question, uh, convener, to I think probably Nikki Wilson is the most appropriate person to respond to this, is that um, people say that um, we no longer live in an age uh, where there is a unitary UK government, that we've got devolution. Therefore, why should the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament uh, 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 be responsible in any way for what happened uh, back then? And Of course, we ask, there is now a Scottish Parliament. There is no longer a Scottish office. There is a Scotland office. We no longer have eight police forces. Uh, there is one. The National Coal Board doesn't exist in the way that it did. 
But my point, my question to Nikki is, does that mean in your view that an apology is impossible and that financial compensation could not, could not be met? Really, as I say, from the NUM's point of view, we really welcome the fact the Scottish Government have taken this step, and we do think it's a brave step because over the years many attempts has been, uh, have been made to the Westminster Government. We thought we were going to be successful when Amber Rudd was the Home Secretary in Westminster, when she agreed that there'd be an inquiry into our grieve and all the rest of it under Theresa May at the time, and then it all changed, it all got dropped. Uh, so, but I think the fact that we have now got a Scottish Parliament, which is so important to the Scottish people, and I think we can, as a Scottish Parliament, if there's a means to do it, have a thing, have the compensation put in line, because whether if, if we try and think back as we progress through the years, hypothetically, if there was still a coal industry or a national coal board, would it be the Scottish Coal Board, for example? No. So responsibilities have changed and passed down the line. I think equally the responsibility of looking at how 206 people lost their livelihood for sometimes paltry offences because of the vindictiveness of an area director that we had at the time, Albert Wheeler, I think it would be a brilliant step and a very brave step and progressive if the Scottish Parliament did make that decision to have a compensation scheme put in place for the remaining miners who are still living and the families of the one that have sadly passed away. Okay. Thanks very much. I think that, that concludes the, the questions from um, um, committee members today. Thanks um, hugely to all of the panel for your insight. I was well, I was about 17, 18 at the time of, of the strike, so um, while I didn't live in a mining area, I was old enough to know that a, a great wrong was happening in our nation at the time, and it's been really important for us to hear directly from, from all of you um, about just what the implications and continuing implications are for that. Well, thank, thank you all very, very much. I'll suspend briefly now before we move to our second panel. Thank you.
Thank you. We'll now hear from our second panel, and I welcome to the meeting Jim McBriarty, um, immediate past president of Retired Police Officers Association Scotland, and Tom Wood, former Deputy Chief Constable, Lothian and Borders Police. So I invite um, each of you witnesses to make a, a short opening statement, um, starting with Jim McBriarty, please. Dina. Um... As a brief introduction, um, I joined Lothian and Borders Police in 1981, the son of a staunch trade unionist and indeed a shop steward uh, at the Grangemouth plant. Um, I was stationed at Leith Police Station, um, and in 1984-5, I was removed from my local community as their dedicated beat officer to police the minor strike, um, both at pits and also at the homes, cars and property of return to work whiners who were being attacked. Um, I policed the strike from the start to the finish and retired from the police service as a detective superintendent in 2012, and I joined the Retired Police Officers Association of Scotland in 2020. I was the president of the association and Understanding the, the, the importance of this review, I engage with the review team on RPOS's behalf and indeed on a personal basis, um, and I ensured that there was an engagement plan for us to, to work with the review team and the, uh, the resulting outcomes and outputs from it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Tom Wood. Yeah, good morning, convener. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet your, your, your panel. Um, my name is Tom Wood. I was a Chief Inspector in Lothian and Borders Police during the 84-85 strike. I'm speaking here in a personal capacity. Um, at that time, I wasn't at the rank where I was a policy maker, but I was privy to the policy being made because at that time my job was as a force information officer. So I was working throughout the strike, uh, the gold commanders, the assistant chief constables who were who were running the police operation, both of whom are now sadly dead. But can I just say that my experience is limited entirely to the east of Scotland and mainly to Bilson Glen. I cannot comment. I have no knowledge about what happened elsewhere. The strike was the, the policing of the strike was not centrally coordinated and so there were differences from force area to force area. And I think somebody uh, in you this morning's panel made that point. Um, first thing to say that eighty four eighty five was a a terrible year for a lot of people. The, the, the mining communities, obviously, and we were acutely aware of that. Many of us uh, lived close to, lived in uh, mining communities, and we, we knew the people who were on strike very, very well. It was also a bad year for the wider community because, as Jim's just said, we had to strip away the whole of our community policing model during that year, and that meant that outside the mining communities also also suffered. And eighty four eighty five was the, the year that heroin really took a grip of many of our inner city areas and it was a time when we could least afford to be light on street policemen. Um, from a police point of view, somebody earlier this morning said it was a, a job that we didn't want to do. That is absolutely right. That is absolutely right. No one wanted to be policing a labour dispute. No one joined the police to police a picket line. We did not want to do it. But in essence, we had no choice because our job is, is simple. We've got to protect life and property. And we had to facilitate peaceful picketing, of course, but we had to protect the human right of people to go about their business unmolested. So we had to protect the rights of miners who wanted to work to be able to go to work and for these working miners and their families to go about their business unmolested. And that hasn't changed at Convener. And if the same circumstances arose today, frankly, the police service would have to do the same job today. Um, For the police, it was a long, exhausting year. It, it, it really was, and we stripped away our resources. There was quite a number of 
injuries. But we were lucky in one way, in that we had very, very good police commanders at that time. Now, the police service, I can look back now in almost 40 years of police service, police service in Scotland hasn't always been well led, but it was then. And we had uh, two chief, assistant chief constables running the police operation who were both um, themselves steeped in the mining communities. One of them had been born and brought up in a mining community, had worked all his days in a mining community, and the other one had been a miner. He had been a Bevan boy uh, just after uh, the end of the, of the Second World War. So they were acutely aware of uh, the stresses and the strains and the issues within the mining community. We also had, very fortunately, a very, very fine chief constable at that time. He's, uh, he's still alive, Sir William Sutherland, who was the best of his generation. And I can say that now, looking back over, over 40 years. Did we have violent confrontations? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. And they were mainly on the days when they were visiting pickets, came to Bilson Glen. Um, for most of the rest of the time, um, we had a good relationship with, with the local um, miners and the local mining leaders, who, as I say, we knew. Um, we did not have a, a good relationship with the coal board um, or, indeed, the National Union of Mine Workers hierarchy, which is different from the local leaders. Um, the coal board sometimes, we found out, were game-playing and um, trying to manoeuvre us into doing what we didn't want to do. And to say there was collusion, and somebody mentioned earlier that there was collusion between the coal board uh, and chief constables, is just not true. Um, and I was there. And I can tell you, it just was not true. Uh, the chief constables made their own decisions. The other thing to say is that the criminal justice system, of course, is very, very distinct from uh, policing. And for anybody to suggest that the police and the procurator fiscal and, and sheriffs are in some kind of um, um, lockstep, well, they haven't met the fiscals and the sheriffs that I've met over my career. Um, these people are, are fiercely independent, and so the decisions they took um, are for them. And to suggest collusion is just not true. It's, it's not within my experience. Coming quickly, and I appreciate the time, talk about this review. <clears throat> when this review was announced, there was a great deal of suspicion amongst retired police officers that this was just an attempt to rewrite history and to gain compensation. And that's why a lot of retired police officers did not participate in it. I mean, John Scott's made reference in his report to the fact that they feared uh, litigation. That's not what they told me. Um, they said to me, quite simply, they thought this was a political gambit to rewrite history. We took a different view. I took a different view. I thought that there was use in this because I think there are lessons to be learned. Um, I, I wrote an article about it a while ago, and I sent in a copy to the committee. Some of you may have read it. Um, five years after the strike, I was a divisional commander in a mining area, an ex-mining area. And I was horrified uh, the extent of which the small, uh, many small mining towns had been completely hollowed out and were in a desperate condition, uh, unemployment, um, fabric had, had, had not been kept up in many of these small towns. And, of course, into that void and vacuum stepped crime and drugs and deprivation. And so my very firm view at that time, and still is, that there are enormous lessons to be learned, not, about, not so much about what happened at the picket line, but what didn't happen <coughs> afterwards. And Somebody said earlier in the morning that, that it's unlikely we'll have a strike like this again. I think that's right. It is unlikely we'll have a strike like this again. But we will still have to manage post-industrial decline. And I think that's the, the, ma the major uh, learning point. As for this review, I think John Scott and his team did a good job. Uh, I really do. Um, I think they did great evidence gathering. They saw the flaws in the remit. Uh, the remit simply said about policing. Um, when it should have been about criminal justice, I think John Scott, uh, with his experience, managed to change that, um, and he managed to do a very good job, him and his team, and they should, 
better congratulations. From a personal viewpoint, I have no objection to the recommendation he made. I I think that the the sacking and blackballing of minors who had been convicted once of simple breaches of the peace was um, disproportionate and spiteful. And so I think uh, the pardoning of, of these men who have lived their lives under that, I think that's, that's fair and just, but that's a, a personal viewpoint. And just lastly, very lastly, and I'm sorry to have gone on about this, but I think sometimes we forget that after the strike, what a contribution was made to the community by the miners' leaders. When I think about our area, and I'm only talking now about East of Scotland and, and the, the, the Bilson, Glen, Moncton Hall area, many of the, the strike leaders went on to enter local politics. One became a very uh, prominent member of parliament, was knighted for his, his, his services. Others became um, good, very good, long-serving um, councillors who did enormous good work um, within the local communities um, and who we worked with very closely. And um, it grieves me that we are almost 40 years later um, with still divisions between us, uh, when in actual fact, when we meet and when I meet these people, and I've met them over the years in various roles and, and various there's actually um, an awful lot more that joins us than divides us. But I think uh, I'd like to place on record just, you know, what a remarkable job after the strike these men did and their contribution to uh, to public life. Thank you very much. Okay, th thank you both for those opening statements. Um, we'll now move on to, to questions. Can I again start with Fulton McGregor, please? Yeah, thank you, convener. Can I uh, thank uh, both the, the panel members for that? Those uh, very um, in-depth and, and at times moving testimonies. And I think it's actually really useful to see because we heard earlier, and, and obviously in the constituency that, that I come from and, and others, I'm very aware of, of, of you know the impact that this has had on mining communities and, and, and miners themselves. But you know to actually hear that reflection uh, in terms of you know how police officers uh, in the main would have been impacted as well, because I think it's coming across quite clear from early evidence anyway that the vast majority of police officers, including yourselves, um, didn't want to um, actually be doing that, that 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 job. You didn't come into the police to do that, and you know you're talking about thirty five years ago there, and I, I think we could all hear the emotion in your voice. Um, and you you were recollecting uh, events which were clearly. Um, uncomfortable for you, so so uh, thanks very much for that. You've actually went on to touch on, um, uh, and that, that's that's the benefit of make, making a, um, a a good long statement like that. So don't don't apologise for it. You've went on to touch on where my main question is. It's about the impact of communities, um, mining communities after the strikes, and you you you've said something about it. Are you able to talk a wee bit more about that? About um, you know how how these communities were, were impacted. What were what were the relationships like with police and Mining communities in in the you know the years and, and decades that 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 followed that. Is it, if there's any comment you can can give on that, based on the fact that I know you've already you've already alluded to. Yeah, I I, I can. Um, the, the, to, to be honest, I mean, one or, one or two individuals obviously felt that they'd been very hard done to, and 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 they had been, they had been. Um, it's one thing to be arrested for a push or breach of peace at picket line. It's quite another to be sacked and then to be blackballed. And I think I think the blackballing um, is 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 the most insidious of these punishments um, because of course it goes on and on and on and on. And it's not just a case of being sacked from your place of employment, but it means you cannot get uh, employment in other areas of the industry that you know and that you work in. So. I, I can understand uh, the bitterness, and I actually attended one of the one of the miners' meetings uh, out in West Lothian that John Scott held, uh, and enjoyed it very much. I, I met up with a whole lot of other people, um, a whole lot of the miners' leaders who I'd, I'd known uh, during the police service, and we had a, we had a good chat about things. And one of them said to me, "He said, oh, I said you're, you're a brave man turning up here.' I said, "Really?" I said, well, "We're all 
We're all 70-year-old men, you know. What does it say about us that we can't sit down and have a conversation about something that happened 35 years ago? So there was that bitterness among some. Generally, there wasn't. Generally, there wasn't. Generally, um, we made an effort after 1985 to get really back in uh, to the mining communities. But some of the small mining towns where uh, where a local pit was, was the only point of employment, Honestly, they were desolate. They were desolate. And I remember when I took up my role as divisional commander in, in the division. I'm not going to. I'm not going to name it. But I, I drove through all the local towns, and some of them, the streetlights were even out. You know, were, and, and and the whole places had been hollowed out. The young people had left um, to seek jobs elsewhere. Um, shops were closed. Um, there had been no investment or employment uh, put back in. And of course, the dreadful waste about that is you had a tremendously skilled workforce there um, who had been allowed to weather on the vine, allowed to go to waste. Uh, and, and I thought that was a tragic uh, aftermath, and I saw it close up over years, and I saw the long-term consequences of it. Um, as I say, where drugs and crime and hand-in-hand uh, hand with deprivation moved in. And as I say, that was always, to me, the, the, the huge learning point from 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 the miners' strike and and indeed from other post-industrial declines because of course the same thing happened with steel the same thing happened with shipbuilding um, and the same thing may happen with oil and um, this is why it's so important to have these conversations so that we do learn lessons. If I if I can just add to that, uh, Bolton, um, as a young lad I was a very keen football player. And one of the things in policing back then was we each of the divisions had a football team. And I can recall we would play minors teams. There was no language. There was no violence either on the pitch or after it. If anything, we would go for a, a beer to socialise and chew the fat. And when I saw this report uh, or this review being being taken on and, and I saw what the report contained, it worried me that we were painting a picture of them and us. Um, now, the them and us only occurred when the um, the miners from elsewhere came to our local area, and we didn't know who they were. They didn't know who we were. And interestingly, some of them commented on how it was their duty to be arrested and taken off the picket lines so that the uh, the NUM would have a face of of um, taking part now. That that's that's sorrowful, to be honest. Um, but our role after the minor strike was to engage and to uh, to bring back the relationships that we had, which were strong and positive um, throughout the whole time. Thank, thanks very much for that. I am in this uh, put in the chat. I've, I've got one further question, but I just wanted to comment. Thanks very much to both of you for. Um, for putting on record the, the impact that you think that the um that this has had on, on communities because it's really um I think that's really quite telling and the impact on communities has, has been long standing and in many ways is, is is still there. Um I wanted to ask a question about the scope of the bill as well. You've heard us ask um the, the previous panel about that. Um and, and obviously the current um proposed scope of the bill is um for minors to be pardoned and, and minors is a, a, what is a minor is defined. I wonder in your experiences though, could you we've been wondering, you know, how often were, were other people maybe involved in the picket line who weren't minors, maybe family or friends or you know, maybe even based on what you said today, um, maybe maybe even some off duty police um but policemen and women. So um you know, was that a common occurrence, or was it mainly minors that were being arrested, um, or was was there like you know a neighbour or a, a you know a friend or a, or a family member, even a spouse or a or a, or a son or daughter, but were they being arrested as well? Was that was that something that was happening? Not, not in my experience. I mean, quite a lot of the arrests, interestingly, quite a lot of the arrests for the more serious offences, and I'll talk about the more serious offences in a minute. Were, were not on the picket line at all, they were, because they were about assaults and intimidation at the homes of, of working miners. Um, the, the, what we had at Bilson Glen at one time was we had a number of people show up um, trying to get muscle in the action. 
and it's been left wing people over the pool selling the socialist worker and trying to um, get themselves into the action, as it were. But I have to say, the local um, the local um, miners leaders gave them short shrift. Um, they, 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 they didn't. They, they were not going to be hijacked, and they were not going to have um, their dispute hijacked by outsiders who had got alternative um, political agendas. So that happened a little bit at uh, Bilson Glen, but but not very much, because as I say, there was a, a degree of uh, there was an awareness amongst the local miners' leaders that um, they, they didn't want um, they, they didn't want the, the dispute subverted um, for for other um, political purposes. And if I can just add, Fulton, that I was, as I said in my introduction, my brief introduction, I was on the picket, I was on police duties policing the picket lines from start to finish off the strike. I never arrested anyone. Not once. Was I pushed? Was I shoved? Yeah, absolutely. But that was the nature of the business. And bearing in mind you're standing next to people who would know you by name prior to the, 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 the vehicles that were coming back into the pit to, uh, to bring the miners in, we'd be talking about what was on the TV the night before, how the families were doing. Um, General chit chat, and as Tom quite rightly says, when there was infiltrators, that's when the mood changed. You could literally, you could smell it, um, because a lot of the miners who were brought in um, from strange areas were there for one reason, and that was to rumble up both the miners who were on the picket line and also the police. And that was when things changed. When we had the local miners doing their picket line, it was, it was. I'm not saying it was pleasant. It was absolutely not, because these men and their wives had a point to make, and they were making legally they were making it. But when that changed, um, the whole tone um, um, dropped remarkably. Can I just add one uh, thing, um, just just to add for information and context? We made the decision. Or I say we, it was a, the operational commander, made the decision that we would not um, wear protective equipment, um, even though we had it. We had helmets and we had shields, and we had protective shin guards and all of these things. We'd had them since the early 1980s after the Scarman report, the Topsted riots. So we had all that kit, but we never used it. And we that was for a part we could maybe have done with it. To be honest, we might have had sustained less injuries. But it was decided not to do it because it would escalate and it, and, and it would up the ante. And the last thing we wanted to do was up the ante because we knew that sooner or later, it turned out it was later, but sooner or later that we'd have to go back and police these communities with consent. And somebody mentioned this morning, and it's a very good point actually, that for the vast, vast majority, um, the mining communities were good, decent, hard-working people. They were the kind of people that the police absolutely depended upon um, to assist them. Um, and, and therefore, it was madness um, to uh, drive any unnecessary wedges in between ourselves and the mining communities. But all that said, and come back to this fundamental point, we had an absolute duty to do to protect the rights of people to go about their business unmolested, and that hasn't changed. Can, can I, can I just come in there? Thanks, Fulton. Can I just come in, Jim? Um, I, I guess one of the things that Fulton's question was alluding to is a concern that perhaps with the definition of a minor, and you, you mentioned that perhaps uh, spouses were at the picket lines, so that. So we're concerned that you know a wife or, or a partner was arrested at the picket line, and, and this bill doesn't pardon them. But obviously, we don't want to be spending huge amounts of time trying to sort something that actually never happened. So, I mean, is, is that are we, are we worrying about something that never happened, or in you, were their wives, partners um, arrested? Like Tom said at the start, I can only speak for the Bilston. Well. The pits that were within Lothian and Borders areas, and I can't recall, I can't say it didn't happen, but I can't recall seeing ladies, let's say ladies, being removed from the picket line. What I can recall is seeing people who were perhaps not minors, but were hell bent on causing trouble, um, and, and, and 
quite frankly, colloquially, winding things up. Um, they were perhaps removed. Now, what happened to them? Because, if you, as you can imagine, when people are removed from the picket line, they are taken away from the, the, the hotspot, and they are removed for the purposes of process. Now, that process can be many things. Um, it could be simply told to go away, and they took the warning, and they would walk away, or, depending on the gravity of what they had done, um, they would be arrested. But I can't speak for um, whether the wives, the sisters, the aunties, the young, you know, yeah. yeah. I've, I've, well, I've, got, I've got no, I've got no recollection of 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 wives and people like that be, being being arrested uh, with with within the end of the year. Um, we, we did have people coming along to cause trouble, and what they would do is they'd go behind the picket line and throw things over the top, um, ball bearings and uh, pieces of metal and stuff onto the police lines. But as I say, there was a degree of self-policing amongst the, the, the picket themselves, and, 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 and these people were, were given short shrift. And, and it, happened, it happened now and again, and so I don't make, want to make too much of it. And, but it did happen, but it was, it was very, very, very quickly snuffed out by the miners themselves. Thank, thanks very much. Fulton, are you OK? OK, thanks very much. Maggie? Thanks very much, Joe, and good morning to, to both Jim and Tom. Thank you for being. Um, we've heard a, a little. We've heard this morning about um, you know challenges and, and accusations of collusion of um, the, the of political interference in policing, and I, I hear quite clearly your refutations of that. Um, but we, we've also heard. You know, and, and we know from some of the narrative around this uh, about the uh, quite a pliant media. And one, one of the things that I, I'm not sure had come out very much prior to, to, to this for, for many people was the disproportionate impact on Scottish mining communities um, compared to, to, to elsewhere during, during, during the strikes. You know, more, more Scottish um, miners were, were arrested, more of them lost their jobs than, than, than elsewhere. And I just I just wanted to explore a little bit about how how some of that might have might have arisen, and, and can I ask and, and maybe to to Jim first of all, when, when you were when you were sent to police the picket lines, how were the miners described to you? What 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 were you told about them? What orders did you receive? And were you told what the operational outcome of, of that policing procedure should should have been? From memory, um, Maggie. Maggie. Um, yeah, it's Maggie. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I need to put the glasses on. Um, <laughs> one thing I didn't need back in 1984, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> what we were told was the numbers of miners that were on the picket line. We were told where they were in relation to the point of entry, point of exit. In other words, were they on both sides of the road of entry? Were they on one side? Um, we were also given an indication of the mood of the miners. Um, now, I say that because that gives you an idea of what you're going to be faced. We weren't marched onto the picket line. We simply got out of the vehicles that we'd arrived in. We walked towards the the, the, um, the picket line. We would we would actually say hello, how are you all doing today? And it would be a bit of banter, a bit of um, Good fun, a bit of good nature, but Maggie, I emphasise again that whole warm attitude changed when we were told today we've got Yorkshire miners, today we've got Durham miners, and I made reference to the smell. These, forgive me, but these people were not in a sober state most of the time. Um, these were people who had been uh, fueled to come onto a picket line and. Um, and express their wishes in quite a hostile way, and that that was when the whole attitude would change, and you could smell it as you would walk towards this larger than normal crowd when we had the miners from elsewhere being brought um, onto the picket line, and that was when it was it was time for us to to steal up, and 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 by that I mean not be as casual in our approach, you know, be 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 more robust. We knew it was going to be a, a stronger push and shove. And don't forget, 
these miners were fit men, extremely fit and strong men. Should they wish, they could have bowled us down the street. And very seldom did we get bowled down the street, but we did get pushed and we did get shoved and we did get swore at. But then once the miners who were going into work had gone in, the pressure was off again. And the miners who came from elsewhere would retire, as it were, to either the local miners' welfare or back to their buses that they came up on. Um, and we'd be left with the local miners having the conversations that I spoke about earlier. So um, does that answer your question, Maggie? Yeah, no, no, that, that that's helpful. Th thank you, Jim. Um, Tom, if I could just ask ask you, um, as um, again, we heard from the evidence this morning that it, it, it appeared that certain individuals were targeted. And I, I, I hear and I take on board what Jim has said about um, miners coming from elsewhere, you know, to, to, to join to join pickets, um, being being the, the touch points quite often. Um, but were were you aware of any specific targeting of individuals? Um, it, it seems that uh, active trade unionists were were targeted more 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 than others, perhaps. Um, what, what, was there any operational decision around that? Any discussions about that kind of focus in on, on police activity? No, no, no. There wasn't. There was there was no there was no arrest policy per se. Um, what happened in the mornings was um, we, we got there about half past five in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, and um, the, the operational commander would get on it. We all came in double-decker buses, and, and um, the operational commander would get on the buses and would walk up and down the line saying hello to everybody and thank them for their coming and all, and all this sort of stuff, and then just give what intelligence we had about the numbers who were going to show up. And, and Jim's absolutely right. It, 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 the difference between when they were visiting pickets and when they were not visiting pickets was was, was chalk and cheese. One of the reasons that the the um, that, that, that local officials were arrested more often than um, others was that they were they were truly front leaders. They were people they were trying to lead and trying to show their leadership, and therefore they were in the front line. And because they were in the front line. Um, they, they were the first to be grabbed. I mean, it's as, just as simple as that. Um, what happens with um, with police arrests? When, when a police officer arrests someone, it is up to them as an individual and a corroborating um, officer to present the evidence that they have, and that goes to the fiscal who makes a decision, and it goes to the court, and the court makes a decision. So it's an individual officer that does that. So. Um, this idea that there was a huge, um, you know, sort of arrest policy is just is just not the case, and and cannot be in 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 the Scottish in the Scottish system. But and and that's the reason why um, local um, officials and and leaders were were arrested was because they were they were leading from the front, and therefore they were in the front line. Okay, th th thank you. And, and just just a brief follow up. Uh, Tom, you spoke earlier about your role and, and the police's role to protect the rights of people going about their business. Um, yeah. Miners and striking miners were were going about their business. And, and, and I just I, I just wondered if you could give us a little bit more of a flavour of when when violence did occur. What 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 were the flashpoints around violence? Um, yeah. You know, you spoke there about uh, people leading the, the un trade unionists leading from the front. You know, we, we've all seen the the pretty horrific um, video footage of of some some of the some of the violence that, that happened on picket lines. Can you just give us a little bit more of, of a sense of of how how those those incidents ar arose? Yeah, of course. But can I, can I just say, say one thing that one of the things that alarmed me about this thing when, when it was the media coverage because it, and and it stopped now, thankfully, and it stopped thanks to the intervention of John Scott, principally, was that they, they kept showing pictures from England, they kept, show, kept showing pictures from Orgreave of um, horses charging and and running fights. None of that ever happened. Um, at, at Bilson Glen, or, or to my knowledge, in the rest of Scotland. As I say, I restrict myself to my knowledge of Bilson Glen. So you've got to be very careful about this conflation of media coverage, um, because it can be very, very misleading. 
You're absolutely right uh, in that it is it was the human right of of striking miners to peacefully picket. Dead right, absolutely, and it was the role of the police to facilitate that, um, which which we did. And it was also the right of the yes, people that wanted to go to their work to go in without being impeded and assaulted and intimidated, and and we, and we were that we were the, the meat in the sandwich, um, trying to hold that balance. Now, when did the flashpoints come? Oh, on the picket line, the flashpoints invariably came when they were visiting pickets, and um, sometimes, as Jim said. Sometimes they'd obviously had a long bus ride and 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 a, a arrived um, um, full of joie de vivre or or whatever it was um, a, a day out um, and um, at that time too the local strike leaders um, often felt that they had to show themselves so they had to had to show their metal and so they were in the front so so these were invariably the flashpoints now the flashpoints. After off picket line were just as important because they involved the families of striking miners, um, of, of, of working miners, um, and and people who wanted to go to work or were seen to be colluding with the, the, the pit management. And they happened in the housing areas, in the streets, um, around about the, um, the mining communities, but not actually on the picket line. So, so these these were the main these were the main flashpoints. Thank you, Tom, and, and thank you both. That's been really helpful. That's it from me, Joe. Okay, thank you. And Alexander, please. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, Jim, and good morning, Tom. Uh, thank you for your comments so far. I'd like to maybe retrace some of them in, in my first question. As I asked initially when, I'm, when we had the miners here this morning, uh, my perception as a youngster in those days was that this was a very bitter and divisive industrial dispute. Uh, and you've given today, uh, Tom, you know, that you had no choice but to manage and to do what you did uh, in supporting uh, the community in your role as police officers. Uh, and the peaceful picketing was your intention to, to manage. Uh, and that, that, I think, comes, comes, comes over. Uh, but what we did also hear this morning from the miners was they felt there was a change in the policing attitude uh, when it stepped from being local to then being much more of a national uh, flavour, uh, and they believed that there was a a, a mind step uh, and, a, and a change in, in policy and procedure when that happened. Uh, can I basically ask both of you, did, did you envisage any of that? Did you interpret any of that or see any of that? Uh, because, they say, the miners today really did express uh, that it all started off at a reasonable level when they knew the people and the police that they were working with on a daily, uh, weekly, and monthly basis. But when police came from other areas, uh, that then didn't seem to be the same accord that took place, uh, and more uh, aggression or more confrontations maybe then took place at that stage. Can you maybe enlighten us on your views on that? Yeah, yes, I can. First, first as people <coughs> say, it, it, the reason why 84, 85 strike was so long and bitter was because it, 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 it was it was very very long. I, I was a, a, a teenage a young uh, teenage policeman in the 1972 strike, um, and 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 it was more violent actually, um, a lot more violent. But of course, it lasted only three months, and that was the difference. Um, the 84, 85 strike, um, the miners' recollection is right. It started off in the March. And the spring weather, and it was it was all it was all fine, um, and and then as the strike went on, um, clearly the striking miners be became more desperate, and and the violence escalated, and we started to get these travelling pickets, which were described. But can I just say to you, and can I make it absolutely clear? And I speak for our area only. We never had outside officers come in to Lothian and Borders Police. There were never any outside officers on the picket line at Bilson Glen. Now, we did send officers to help Fife and Central Scotland Police at that time, because they were much smaller forces. But, as I said at the beginning of my um, evidence, I can only speak personally for Lothian and Borders, and we made a policy, a firm policy, that we would not have outside officers 
um, on our picket lines, and that wherever possible, it should be local officers who were to to the front, um, so as to try to keep as far as we could this this connection. Alec, the the uh, the procedure that Tom's talking about is called mutual aid, and it's something which is jealously guarded within policing. Um, in fact, only in the last five or six years have I known the great Metropolitan Police Service of London ask for mutual aid. Um, but I can categorically state that I knew every police officer who was standing next to me on the picket line in 84-5 as being local, but to Lothian and Borders Police. And I would, I would, I would seek clarification from those who spoke this morning, saying that it was when officers came from other areas. What did he mean by that? Because as a Leith officer, I, I had nothing to do with mining. There was no mines in Leith that I'm aware of. We certainly dug plenty holes, but there was no mines in Leith. And um, when I was there, for abstracted from my community to its discontent and removed to police the mining, I would be regarded as an officer out with the area. So when I moved out to, to, to Bilston Glen, the Bilston Glen miners would not know me to start with, but they did as the weeks progressed. and They would get to know you at uh, uh, Moncton Hall. They would get to know you at yeah. Paul Kemet. They would, they would get to know you. So. For, for for us to say, and as Tom rightly says, we never had mutual aid. In other words, officers from another force area brought in to help us with Lothians. But as the picket line numbers increased, we would therefore mobilise ourselves to make sure that if the focus of the picket was at Paul Kemet, or was at Moncton Hall, or was at Bilston Glen, the numbers that we were able to deploy would be moved about the area, the force area, I hasten to add, to make sure that we could um, 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 help. And if, if I may touch on people saying that there was a, a, a sea change in the way the policing attitude to this was going on, very sinisterly, a lot of police officers and their families were targeted on the streets after, during the minor strike. They were being spat on. They were being assaulted as their kids went onto buses by families of minors who were on strike. When word gets that, when word like that gets round, I can assure you, and it's only human reaction to realise that suddenly the game had changed. But the game had changed on both sides. The game had changed when police officers themselves, their families, their wives, um, were being attacked on the street, going about their lawful business of simply going to the shops. When these things happen, and 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 that that is fed into police officers. You suddenly realise that this isn't the happy, clappy event that we thought we were dealing with at the outset. Suddenly, there was a sinister turn to this. And forgive me, but human nature being what it is, you're there to protect yourselves and your colleagues, your families and their families as best you possibly can. And it does change. It's an attitudinal change, and I hope it's understandable. And, and I think you identified the, the length of time uh, that the duration of the strike. Uh, it, it probably went through phases uh, as to how things. It certainly, in my view, as someone who only watched and, and saw, uh, I certainly saw different phases of it from the media uh, and the televisions and the things in, in my in my time scale. Uh, so we we all we all understand uh, that the pardon is intended to remove the stigma, uh, and that is the crux of where this bill is trying to go. Uh, but by pardoning. Uh, what was seen as a, as a criminal conduct, uh, is it not just uh, rewriting history? It would be good to get your sort of take on that. I, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's a difficult one. And, and I speak personally. Um, on balance, on balance, I think that um, the people who were convicted of a, a simple push-shove, what we call a push-shove, which is the piece, um, and, and who were thereafter um, sacked and blackballed, I, th I think that was disproportionate. And I think that runs against 
natural justice, to be honest. Now, now, if that is pushed out and people who assaulted the police or people who are convicted several times or people who are convicted of more serious charges, um, if, if they are pardoned, then I think it's a different question. Then I think it's a completely different question, and and I would not, and I I wouldn't, uh, I I don't think on balance that that would be appropriate just to give a blanket pardon to people in that situation. I think I think there are appeals procedures, and there's the Scottish Criminal Case Review Commission, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, who are well equipped to to deal with that kind of complexity. But personally. If we're only talking about people who have a single conviction for a, a breach of the peace and who have been punished extrajudicially thereafter, um, then, I, then I think it's in the interest of natural justice um, that they be pardoned. I, 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 I do, and that's, a, that's a, a personal view I have. But I would, I would draw the line there, and I think, I think one of the concerns amongst my former colleagues is that this, that this drift. Um, and that and that people are are pardoned for all sorts of more serious um, criminal offences, um, often inv involving assault and intimidation and and you know crimes like that. So I hope that I hope that lets you know where I where I come from on this. And can can I just maybe add through the convener um, one of the. Uh, one of the notes that I read about this pardon is the inclusion of Section 411A, um, where it was referenced as merely being obstruction of police officers. Forgive me, but Section 411A of the Police Scotland Act 67 covers a whole multitude of things, um, including assault on a police officer. So, when I read that there was consideration being given to a pardon for a 411A, um, I would ask that the the the, the panel um, through the convener considers exactly what that offence was, because if it was police assault, um, then there should be some form, I would hope, of understanding to what extent that police assault took place, um, because it isn't just merely obstructing the police officer; um, it can be far more serious than that. And I think actually one of our one of Tom's and mine's colleagues of many many years ago, she had her leg smashed and broken um, during the minor strike, and I think 411A was libelled for that, as opposed to a common law assault. Because if an officer in uniform is assaulted, invariably it defaults to 411A. So I ask you to to be very careful that the inclusion of 411A to your bill is not seen to um, the, uh, the the police assault aspects of what this may include. Thank, thank you for, for, for being so frank uh, and also uh, imparting your knowledge and wisdom uh, as to where this uh, could go uh, if we, uh, as a, a, a committee and uh, as a parliament, uh, don't look at all the aspects of it. Uh, because, as I say, on the surface, it, it, it comes across as uh, what you would expect. But when you dig deeper, there are there are further elements and layers that need to be advised and looked at to ensure that we do get the parity that's required. Uh, thank you, convener. Thank you, and uh, Karen, please. Thank you, convener. Um, thank you, Jim and Tom, um, for, for for speaking so plainly. Um, this just checking the time; it is still morning this morning. Um, you know what's really apparent to me is. There has been uh, an outstretching of hands, you know, of, of trying to build some bridges between the police and the miners. And, and we heard the witness statements this morning saying that, you know, when it came to the community police, you know, police that they'd known and grown up with, and family and friends, that there was, um, you know, some understanding and, and some unity there. But we have also heard that there there's still some discrepancies um, between. People's witnesses, um, witness testimonies between yourselves and the witnesses we heard this morning. Um, so even these many, you know, years on, there's still um, some friction there. But also in terms of um, what I see as a 
as a power imbalance as well. And, and where did that power lie at the time? And I think that's something that you know us as elected representatives really have to remember that you know the the, the police force and uh, the miners and you know the, the extended family and the ripple effects throughout communities were all the the victims in in this, in this case, and that the people um, you know being held to account should be the ones who are making these decisions without thinking through the ramifications for everyone involved. Um, I would just really like to ask you, you, you spoke a bit there about pardons and, and being very careful and, and how that is implemented, and you spoke about uh, was it 41A. Um, in terms of a pardon, how, how do you yourselves, what, what is your opinion on pardons themselves? Um, you know, for the minors, do you think there are other alternatives that could be suggested, or do you feel that pardons are the right way to go? To, to um, Jim Marshall. Sorry, I'll, I'll first thing. I, um, I I think it, I think it's very important we get this right, and and, I, and I'll tell you why. It's about the credibility of these inquiries. Uh, and, and there is a, a degree of scepticism out there about, um, you know, 35 years, 40 years afterwards, revisiting these things, rewriting history. There is a concern about that. So I think it's very, very important that the outcome is is seen to be fair and balanced. Uh, you know, the proof of the pudding and, and all of that stuff. And and I think that's also important because I, I think these kind of independent inquiries changed by John Scott have immense value. Um, because we can learn lessons from them to take forward, um, and if they what, if they have to retain their credibility, then um, I, I think I think the outcomes have to be seen to be to be fair and balanced. Now, coming coming to the pardon thing, it's a very very difficult question. But but I would say this to you that I I attended one of the miners' meetings um, with uh, with the John Scott inquiry and. Sat next to and listened to um, the testimony of miners who had been who had been arrested, uh, had been uh, union officials had been arrested on the picket line, um, had been fined fifty quid for breach of the peace, whatever it was, but then had been sacked um, and then had been blackballed, um, and their whole lives their whole lives had been marked by this incident, and and, and they were. Otherwise, um, law-abiding, um, highly uh, reputable citizens, and just good, good people, just good people. And so, how do we how do we put that right? Uh, and the only way, and I think John Scott had this same conundrum. I mean, he's a he's a lawyer, and he would have recognised the difficulties of pardons. I think in this instance. He thought it was the only thing that could be done, and, and I have to say, um, I think he was right. I think it's very difficult to to see any other way you could uh, right that wrong. You, you cannot you cannot de blackball them. You cannot give them their jobs back as miners when there are no jobs for miners and they're seventy years old. It's very hard to fill in that 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 gap where where they were they were. Badly, badly done to, um, and I suppose, and I suppose it's a, it's a, to it's a token, um, but it's a very important token. And if it's important to these men as they reach old age, um, then I, I reach the conclusion that I, I think it's, it's, it's right. And, but, but, but I say again, don't want to repeat myself. We've got to be careful that we do not um, extend the pardon and push it out and pardon people who were who were guilt, found guilty of more serious crimes. I think that's the balance we've got to strike. Okay, thank you. Can, can we now go to Pam Duncan Glancy, please? Thank you very much, convener, and thank you to, to Jim and Tom for your, your really candid honest and, and open evidence this morning. And I'd like to echo what my colleague Tan Adam said about stretching stretching the hands across um, minors and, and police um, over the years. It's come across really strongly that there is um, a sense a sense of that. 
Where I want to, to ask a couple of questions, though, is just where there's a few areas where, where things don't, um, don't necessarily kind of add up um, from what, what we've heard, some things from this morning and, and from, from yourself. So it would just be helpful to get a little bit of clarity. I think um, un, it is absolutely the case, um, as, has, as you've, you've noted, Tom, that the job is to protect um, people and, and their livelihoods and their homes. But it was, it was put to us earlier that in some cases, some people didn't have that protection. Um, and in particular, people who were striking uh, didn't have that protection. And someone you will have heard the evidence where um, they, they spoke of, of their cat being poisoned, of their windows being smashed, and they're not getting the same protection from um, police, perhaps as people who had gone to work. So just really to, to understand a little bit more about, about that and your views on that. And also um, in a, a similar sort of, um, dis I suppose, disproportionate um, approach would be, well, how, would, how would you help us to understand the difference between the way that people in Scotland tended to, to be treated um, as opposed to elsewhere. And so we know there were more arrests, there were more people um, proportionately uh, who lost their jobs as well. Um, so how, how could you help us understand a bit more about that? Um, so those are the, the, that's the first kind of area, and then um, I'll move on to one other thing uh, briefly after that. Thanks. I heard those remarks this morning about um Miners who were striking not being off afforded the same service from the force, and um, my mind went back to when we were drawn out um, on night shift, and as we regarded it as security patrols, and we were housed, as it were, in vehicles to protect striking miners and return to work miners um, their property, because what happened is. Returning miners started to grow in number, and you had pockets of them. Um, there were confrontations between the growing number of return to work miners and those who were remaining on strike. So, I would question um, what was said this morning because my experience as a frontline officer who would sit for hours on end in a vehicle looking at the front door, as it were, of a striking miner's house to make sure that. Those who had returned to work um, didn't carry any acts, and thankfully none did take place. But the intelligence was indicated that it possibly would take place. Um, I I would dispute what was said this morning, as someone who was there took part in the um, let's call it the protection of the striking miners um, whilst they weren't at home. Um, so yeah, I, I I would question what was said to you this morning. Um, can, can, I, can I just say that um, at the start of the strike, obviously there were a lot more striking miners than working miners. You know, there was a couple of handfuls of working miners in March '84, and as time went on, um, more and more miners drifted, started to drift back to work, and that opened up um, wounds in, in small mining communities where you had uh, a great deal more. Um, working miners and striking miners, and so at the start it was very, very simple because there was only a handful of working miners that we had them to go about their business. As we've said, as the year went on and it got into winter, and it was a bitter winter. That was the other thing that that um, <laughs> that was a real factor. Um, and 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 collieries and um, pits are, tend to be built in the most windswept, cold places. And it was a bitter, bitter winter, which n none of that helped. And so you had um, de deprivation starting to creep into the families of striking miners, and they saw working miners going back, and the whole thing was drifting. And there was a point in time where, in the in the winter of '84, <clears throat> where that became that became really, really difficult. Now I don't know. I when you're dealing with Thousands, a, a throughput of thousands of police officers and thousands of miners and hundreds of incidents taking place, sometimes dozens and dozens in a day. <clears throat> I'm not, I'm not saying that what the chap said this morning was was wrong. I don't, I don't know, and I can't comment. What I can say though is that we tried, um, and the operational commander uh, Hugh Watson, who's a great, great man tried to be as even-handed as he could be. 
And this even-handedness um, was really his central mantra, because he came from a mining community, and and he knew the stresses and strains within the mining community, and he knew that we had to go back in there once it was all done and re-establish relationships. So, so least damage, soonest mended was was always his his view. So, the, the everybody should have got the same service, and if and if on occasions somebody didn't get the same service as somebody should have done, then 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 that was a that was a failure. Um, but it was it was nothing to do with policy. That's and that's the point. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's that's helpful to un, to, to understand. Um, the the last question I have is around the the relationships between yourselves, um, other police authorities, and the the national coal boards. Um, you spoke earlier briefly about those relationships. It would be good to understand a bit more about them and and how much com- how how much kind of conversation went on about um, individuals themselves, where they were, what they were doing, and the approach that you might or might not want to take with them. Well, I, I can tell you about that because I was close close to the policy. There was no relationship, um, and there was <laughs> there was one occasion where, and, and I, I can tell the story because the my old chief uh, told it himself uh, to John Scott, where he got a phone call one afternoon from somebody within the in the coal board, um, ask, encouraging him to do more, to do something or other, and it was a very short conversation because uh, Sir, William, Sir William Sutherland said to him, "You do your job." And I'll do mine, and the phone was put down. Now I I can't speak for what happened in other force areas. What what I can say is, knowing the the chief constables of the time, um, Pat Hamill, Sir Patrick Hamill, and Strath Clyde, and and the other chief constables, um, I cannot, I just cannot imagine um, any of them um, taking direction or encouragement from the coal board. Um, we were very aware that there was some game playing going on um, on both sides, also by the coal board. The redrawing of lines in the road and stuff like this. It was, it was playground stuff at Hackles, <coughs> where the, the coal board overnight would, um, would paint a line on the road and say that was their property and the pickets weren't allowed over it and all this nonsense. Right? And, and I remember Hugh Watson dealing with that. Very, very peremptorily, and 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 saying, you know, no, um, this is the way we're going to do it, and this is my my uh, responsibility, and and putting things very much in their in their place. So, again, I can't speak for what happened elsewhere. I don't know, but I can tell you for sure um, that um, there was no uh, direction or collusion, and. Somebody mentioned this morning that there was collusion between the coal board and the sheriffs and the procurator fiscal service. No, no, I'm sorry. You, you, you simply, you simply do not know these people, the procurator fiscals and the sheriffs of that time or of this time, are fiercely independent. And when I say fiercely, I use the word advisedly. Um, the thought that they would take direction or be influenced by uh, members of the coal board or, or anybody else is, sorry, it, it's, it's incredible in the true sense of that word. Pam, you asked the question about um, the way policing was being done. At that time, there were eight police forces in, in Scotland, and um, I went on through my career to become a public or a national public order commander, so I could reflect on my time as a frontline officer, um, how we were ordered, how we were um, fed intelligence, how we were um, made aware of how policing was to be done, and I can, I hope, reassure you that the way we were policing the minor strike was a far lesser regimented, disciplined way by which things um, would be done. When you see, for example, uh, when we had major public disorder in the streets of London, Manchester, Birmingham, which I I can recognise as being tactically um, very challenging. But the way we were asked to police the minor strike um, was on a 
a far softly, far more uh, softly, softly approach. If I can use the pun, um, it was it was um, it was dealt with in a way where, as Tom rightly says, and I can recall Hugh Watson, the former police commander for the force, coming on to the buses that we had um, when Arthur Scargill came to town and and his entourage. Um, it was done so that we could still police the streets with credibility in these communities. Throughout that uh, whole uh, year-long uh, uh, event, so please be reassured there was no underhand, there was no spinning off the tactics. Um, the tactics have changed. The tactics have changed enormously for public disorder, but back then we policed it as we thought we would in an appropriate way to return to the the, the, the communities that we once policed um, on a da on a daily basis. Thank you. And uh, can we go to Pam Goffo, please? Thank you, convener, and thank you to the witnesses for coming along today to give evidence. I know it's probably not easy, um, you know, going back that many years. Think about what happened then, and also thank you so much for being so honest in relation to that you had to do a job that you didn't want to do. And you had no choice, but as a police officer, you had to protect life and property. And also, you know, Jim, what you talked about, that your families, um, you know, just walking down the street were attacked, spat on, so what you were going through. Also, relating back to what Tom talked about and you, um, Jim, in relation to pardons, and that how, par how we need to be very careful in relation to giving who the pardon, especially not to people that you've said that have actually uh, did something very more seriously, like you mentioned the police officer, that the woman um, and the, her serious injuries. Just on that, I want to touch on a little bit about yourselves here. What impact the minor strike had on you when you look back at the time and now today when you're talking about it? Um, I can talk personally about that uh, from a family point of view. Um, the reason I mentioned in my introduction that I was the son of a staunch trade unionist and a shop steward, he never spoke to me for four months. He could not come to terms with his son um, policing something that he firmly believed in um, until Arthur Scargill um, became far more high profile. My father, my late father, um, wouldn't talk to me across the dinner table. My mother was the United Nations in our family. She tried to bring us together, but my family was my father was so steeped in trade unionism and at his and at his role as a shop steward looking after men, um, and I can say men because back then in the petrochemicals plant it was men by and large who were there. So I can assure you the impact of the miners' strike on me was immensely personal, even in my home life. Um, as far as later years is concerned, as I said two or three minutes ago, I can reflect on the way we were asked to police versus the way that now we are, are, are trained in a far more disciplined way and more regimented way of doing things. But um, for me, I, I fully sympathise with the miners, fully sympathise with them. Um, and I hope that the truth that gets told um, is listened to and uh, considered when it comes to considering the pardons as, as, as we take this forward. Um, it's an interesting question, and, and thanks for asking it. I suppose um, it was, it's one of the minor strikes, one of these things. As you go through a police service, there are certain sort of milestone markers. There are turning points in your service where you were doing certain things at certain times, and you always take as a sort of point of reference. And the minor strike was one of them. Um, I was a career detective, and I was called away um, from a, a child murder investigation, which I was very deeply involved in, um, to come and take on this role um, as, the, as a chief inspector and, and, and work with, with the miners' strike. So it was a big change for me, and, and I, um, 
I, w I was very disappointed at being called away from from the murder investigation because these things become um, become very personal. I, I suppose the thing I think about uh, and and the thing I've been banging on about about this morning is the secondary consequences of these things. We we tend to think of the minor strike and it was picketing and it was horrible and. Uh, but we don't think about the secondary consequences enough. And I, I saw these secondary consequences up close and personal five years later when I was a divisional commander policing uh, an ex-mining area and saw the devastation, and I use that word advisedly, to some small mining communities. Now, somebody said this morning that these had grown back, and they have grown back. They have grown back. They've grown back as commuter towns. Um, but for... Twenty years, twenty-five years, they, they they were they were hollowed out, and um, and and the damage the, the damage done there is incalculable. We we don't know what the health consequences were from that. We don't know what the crime consequences were. We don't know what the addiction consequences were uh, of that. We will we will we will never know. But but what I saw five years later in in some of these communities. Um, was 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 desperate, um, and I see again the only value of us sitting here talking about this is is lessons learned, and and for me that's the big lesson. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> I'd frozen yeah. there. Sorry. So, thank you so much for being like honest and responding to that, Jim. I wanted to touch on something you talked about later on. You became, you went to become a public order commander, and um, looking back, is there anything that you would have looked at that you would have did differently if you were in that role at that time in the police? No, Pam. To be honest. Um... You know, back then, when the minor strike first started, we were talking local police officers policing local mines, policing local miners that were on strike, um, because that's all it was. There were no return to work miners. These things seemed to be the tipping point when miners started to go back to work. That is, they were the tipping point for when the attitudinal change took place. People became more hyped up about the whole thing. Truly totally understandable. Um, would I change anything? Not really. No. Um, you know, public public order, public disorder is a very um, strong thing to have in a community. Very, very strong. And um, when we see, as as I'm sure we all do, the the images of of London, Manchester, Birmingham, the riots that took place, that's a different mindset to what we had in in, in the communities. We knew most of the miners locally by first names, as they did us. And Tom made a very good point that a mining community is a very close knit community. And when there was something took place, like perhaps a child murder or something along those lines, those were the communities that we would reach into, and they would help us. That hasn't changed. That hasn't changed at all. And you know, I go back to the lasting words of of, of Hugh Watson. We are here because we're coming back here. We're here because we're going to come back and help these communities and work through this. Because the writing was on the wall six, seven months into the uh, the, the, the strike that things were going to be different. And if I'm just to jog the memory, corporate memory being what it is, the 84-5 strike was, in some respects, the last throw of the dice for the NUM as far as mining was concerned, because they came through. The early 70s uh, uh, miner strike, and we'd we'd seen that change in what it came out. So when it got to 84.5, we were in the realms of um, this could be our last stand. And sadly, history will show that perhaps for these communities, it was the last stand. There were efforts made to go back in, um, and and it just didn't happen. It didn't happen. Can I just add one thing? You asked what would be different. I mean, there would be some things different in the. Um, officers now uh, going into a situation like that would 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 have to be wearing personal protection equipment, um, helmets, um, body armour, and shields. I mean, the the changes in health and safety, 
um, over the over this last um, 35, 40 years have been enormous. Um, now, I, I remember he was making the decisions at the time about whether we would wear protective equipment or whether we would not. I've, re, re, I've already spoken about that, and it, and it was a very brave decision he made because what he was in actual fact saying was that you know yes we're going to accept some kind of injuries but we're going to do it because we do not want to be seen to be escalating this this um, dispute and this comes back to to Jim's point about his vision about going back in and how to how to play it uh, as as low key as possible and he thought that by uh, gearing ourselves up in in helmets and all sorts of stuff would 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 be would be raising the stakes and so he made the decision not to brave decision brave decision um i don't think um police commanders today would have that discretion i think i think you'd be you'd, you'd have to be wearing your helmet and your shield thank you very much okay thank you and can i now go to richard leonard please thank you convener and thanks again for the opportunity to um uh, to ask a couple of very brief questions um language is extremely important and the choice of words um in this session has struck me and i want to begin uh, by asking jim mcbriarty who used the expression about infiltrators i mean presumably you don't consider nikki wilson alec bennett and bob young to be infiltrators i mean how many of those 400 odd convicted miners we're talking about would you classify as being infiltrators? Language, I thought, that Tom Wood used, which I've seen him use before, um, um, really uh, resonated. Uh, so I think you spoke, Tom, about um, the coal board exercising extrajudicial punishment that you considered to be spiteful, disproportionate, excessive, and so on, um, because um, somebody perhaps simply uh, sacked for a, a, a minor breach of the peace offence was subsequently sacked and blackballed. Um, under those circumstances, what do you think the most appropriate remedy is? And I mean, you spoke about the the lives changed and the the lives lost and and the course of people's destinies being changed by that simple act, uh, which is extrajudicial punishment, as you describe it. So, in those circumstances, do you not think there is at least a case uh, for some form of compensation to be paid to people? I, I'll answer that first. I, I... I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the best person to, to judge that, but I was. I have been struck by um, the, the tremendous damage done to people uh, over a long period of time um, by what I, what I say, and I, and, and I use the words advisedly, of extrajudicial punishment. And that's what it was. Um, it was um, it was completely disproportionate um, to um, be sacked and blackballed for for a straightforward push of breach of the peace. Um, so, but in the, in terms of compensation, I don't know. To be honest, Richard, I don't know what would compensate um, someone um, for that that kind of um, damage and unforeseen consequences. I'm 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 quite sure um, these these men who were on the picket line when they got arrested, um, they had absolutely no idea what the long term consequences of that would be. Um, how could they? Um, but uh, as for compensation, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how much. I mean, what, 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 what would, what would compensate you for that kind of hurt, um, for that kind of, of, of grievous wound through your life? What, what are we talking about? How do you, how do you put pound shillings and pence against that? And, and, and that's why um, I think that John Scott was right. Um, and, and some of my colleagues will not agree with me on this, and, and that's fine. But I think all he could recommend would, would be um, was, was, was a pardon to, to, to try and make some symbolic um, healing um, to, to what was a what was a dreadful experience for them. And as I say, it, it's um, I've spoken already about secondary consequences. Well, well, that was a secondary and and a and a very grievous consequence for them, particularly the blackballing uh, for them for years. Um, and I remember I was at one of the meetings and speaking to a, a man about my age who said that for years and years and years <laughs> he had 
he had made excuses not to go on holiday to Florida with his family. And he'd all sorts of cited all sorts of excuses for not doing it. He wasn't feeling well, any of the sore leg. And also. The truth was that he thought that when he presented himself at U.S. Customs, he would be turned away because he had a conviction for a breach of the peace. Now, uh, you know, that's appalling that that man's life uh, and his family life had been so yeah. badly marked by by such such an incident. I mean, it wouldn't as it happened, he was wrong. It wouldn't have been. It, it wouldn't have registered. But he didn't know that, and so it had changed his life market. And, and the other thing, Richard, by outsiders, we're not talking about miners' um, officials. We're talking about a very, very brief time. I think it was about the autumn of '84 when uh, things were reaching a peak at Bilson Glen. There were small numbers um, of um, extreme left-wing activists came on the scene. Um, sensing, sensing an opportunity to, to cause trouble, the troublemakers um, who, who arrive at any scene uh, like that. Um, and, and all credit to, to the local miners' leaders. Uh, they were given short shrift. They were recognised for what they are, and, and, they were, and, and they were chased away before they could, before they could cause trouble. Richard, you asked about my use of the word infiltrators, and Tom's obviously covered it there. Um, the infiltration um, to the the picket lines were those who would not be usually on point, as it were, for for the uh, the picket lines of the day. And I tried not to give this example, but I think it it captures it quite well. A good friend of mine was on a police officer was on the uh, the picket line, and there was a guy who, as this friend of mine described him, when he stood up, he put the sun out. He was so tall, he was so big, a strapping big man. But he was on the front, and he was pushing and he was shoving, and because of his size and bulk, it took four officers to to keep this man back, and he wouldn't heed the warning, so he was removed from the picket line, and. Um, Taken to through the police lines to where the, the, the police vehicles were. And on the way back, um, this friend of mine had a hold of his wrist, because back in those days we didn't have handcuffs, um, but he had a hold of his wrist. And this friend of mine had a fit of hay fever sneezing. So he let go of this um, uh, miner, this arrested miner's wrist, whereupon the miner reached into his pocket. And gave him a handkerchief, a clean handkerchief, and he said to him, "There you are, officer. That might help if you know to help with your sneezing." So that connection being made, um, my friend said to him, "What on earth are you doing?" He said, "Your heart's not in this. I can tell your heart's not in this, but you just wouldn't take the the, the warning of you have to stop pushing because you know you're, you're you're causing a problem." His reply, which is quite quite remarkable was, I have done my duty, son. I have got myself arrested. That's what I was sent here to do. And he was from Durham. So when I talk about infiltrators, there seemed to be a, 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 a desire on their part to show strength. And sadly, in showing that strength, the local miners, the officials uh, from the local pits felt as though they had to up their game as well. So when Nicky and forgive me, I can't recall the gentleman who spoke earlier on spoke about being arrested several times. It was possibly because they felt obliged to up their game and um, make it that they were seen to be leading, as Tom said earlier on, from the front. Well, the infiltration was by and large when we had miners coming in from other areas with a reason for being there. The raison d'etre for this man, this man I spoke about, was he was there to be arrested. Okay. Are you okay, Richard? Okay. Thanks very much. I think that's the end of uh, questions from the committee. We've taken a bit longer than we'd expected, but um, thanks so much to both of you for for giving us your your, your time. That's been really really helpful for the work that we've got to do. Um, so that brings us to the 
um, end of the public part of our meeting. Um, our next meeting will be Tuesday, the 18th of January, when we'll meet in private to consider our draft programme on the petition to end conversion therapy and to consider our future work programme. So I now close the public part of the meeting and move into private for the final items of our agenda today. Thank you all. Thank you.